and welcome everyone to this afternoon's seminar on a, a Canvas overview or an introduction to the use of Canvas in online and web enhanced courses, which covers all of our courses right now uh, at the district. Um, I'm Dave Giberson. I was the senior instructional design coordinator at Online Learning Pathways at the district until about two and a half years ago when I retired, moved to Northern Idaho, as you see behind me here. I'm uh, now I'm just a senior citizen. <laughs> They've asked me to come back and uh, consult a little bit and help out with this unprecedented situation we all find ourselves in and our transition to Canvas as well. So I'm happy to do that and happy to see you all uh, this afternoon. I see a lot of old friends and some new ones as well. So I hope we'll, uh, hope we'll have some fun this afternoon and uh, hopefully I won't put too many of you to sleep. Occurs to me I didn't get that cup of coffee I was going to try before I did this. So hopefully I won't be the one falling asleep. <laughs> oh, rub it in, Mary. <laughs> okay, that's great. Um, well, let's get started talking about Canvas then. Canvas is a learning management system, basically a big web server that allows you to do kind of three basic things. One, it allows you to uh, provide information to your students. You can post information in the form of computer files or web pages on Canvas or links to content outside of Canvas that, you're, that you can share with your students. You can put them on there. Your students can log into Canvas later, come into your course, and see that information, read it, view it, uh, download it, whatever. So it's a great way to share information with your students asynchronously. Information ranging from your course syllabus, to your lecture notes, to exam prep, to material, outside readings, whatever you might hand out in class, or reading assignments in their textbook. So anything you'd hand out or assign in class, any kind of content, you can put on Canvas and your students can access it at their leisure, at their schedule, or on their schedule. Another thing you can do with Canvas is you can do assessment with Canvas. You can give tests, you can assign homework and accept homework on Canvas. Students can take their tests on Canvas and the results be supplied to you for grading. Uh, Canvas can grade the test if it's objective. If it's subjective, you'll have to grade at least some of it, but you'll have it on Canvas without it ever having to hit paper. And the third thing you can do in Canvas is communicate with your students asynchronously. That is in such a way that you don't all have to be online at the same time unlike Zoom, which is intended as a synchronous tool, as we're using it this afternoon, where we're all online at the same time and talking to one another. Canvas gives you wonderful communications tools that are asynchronous, where you can communicate without all being online at the same time. Things like Canvas announcements, the messaging or email system in Canvas, discussion forums, and the like. So we're going to look at all of those things in Canvas today. Just <laughs> we're going to we're going to hit right hit or uh, hop right across the top of all of them. We're not going to be able to go into all of them in detail today, of course, but we're going to at least give you the information, hopefully, that you need to get started with Canvas, so that you'll at least know what questions to ask <laughs> when when you start to use Canvas for something else. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, which I'll be doing for much of the day. That's Zoom's superpower, what makes it a virtual classroom. So let's, let me back out. I, I'm a little ahead of myself here. Let me back out 
to the Canvas login page. The first thing we need to know, of course, is how to get to Canvas and how to get into it. Uh, Canvas is located at uh, our Canvas instance is located at sdccd.instructure.com on the World Wide Web, right there. Let me put that in the chat tool. Launch Instructure, that's a made up word, it's the name of the company that writes Canvas. And that is now at the bottom of the chat tool. You can also find it linked to the district homepage, uh, the web pages of all the colleges and continuing education, and our online learning pathways web page as well, of course. But the easiest way to get to it is just to type that in to the location line on your web browser and press enter. And here's the Canvas login page. It's not much to look at, but it works. Uh, in order to access your Canvas account, which you all have, assuming that you have a current teaching assignment, either a contract or a TAO. If there are any of you who don't here that don't fit into that category, uh, we'll have to make you Canvas accounts, and we can do that, certainly. I would be happy to. Any employee of the district, you know, with a reason to access Canvas certainly is welcome to have one. But all faculty get the account all automatically. And all matriculated students, all students who are, have registered for a course at the district also have a Canvas user account created automatically through integration with PeopleSoft. And everybody accesses Canvas, almost everybody accesses Canvas the same way with the, their 10 digit PeopleSoft uh, user ID or employee or student ID and their password initially is set to their eight digit birth date. Month, month, day, day, year, 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 year. As you see down here at the bottom, we've put those login instructions right here at the bottom of the, of the uh, login page on Canvas. So you don't have to remember this anymore. It's always there. For instance, on the birth date, sometimes we have a little bit of confusion on that. So let's make sure everybody gets that. The, your initial password is month, month, day, day, year, 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 year. So if you're, let me make that a little bigger. So if your birth date is June 1st, 1998, your password will be zero six for June. If it's a single digit month, got to add a zero in front of it. Same for the day, a one, and then one nine nine eight. That would be that person's password in Canvas. So you should be able to access Canvas that way right away. And many of you probably, most of you probably have already. My user ID is a little different because I was like the second person loaded into the system <laughs> back when I was still an employee. So I, I, my login ID is a little different. <laughs> but then you just click login and here you are at the Canvas dashboard. This is where you will be dropped every time when you log into Canvas. Uh, this shows your current courses. Each colored rectangle or tile represents a course, including that one down there that's just driving me nuts with the little mortar boards dropping in. And so I'm going to remove that off the screen. I can't think while I'm looking at that thing. Uh, the, uh, each tile represents a course. You should have shells or containers for your core, each of your current courses on your dashboard when you first log in. Those are created automatically and you can just start using them right away. 
even if you've never used Canvas before. You can do, there'll be blank shells you can go in and you can start doing with them the things that we're going to talk about today. You enter a course just by clicking on its tile. So pretty simple. Um, the very first thing you learn about a new complex software system that you're presented with and expected to use is how to get help. And that you will find in abundance in Canvas. If you look over here at the system menu on the left, this is a series of icons that are kind of outside the purview of any single course. These are system level resources. Uh, and th this will always be on your screen whenever you're logged into Canvas. And at, near the bottom of this menu is a help button. And that's probably the first thing we need to talk about. This is how you get help with Canvas. This is how your students can get help with Canvas as well. There are 24-7, 365 support hotline phone numbers for both faculty and students, two different numbers. And you see those here at the top of the help menu. Those are always available to you. Uh, given the sudden vast increase in the nationally and internationally in the use of Canvas, um, those hotline numbers are pretty slammed right now. I, I've heard stories of people having to wait for an hour or more to, to get through. Once you get through, these folks are very good, but I do realize, uh, be, do be prepared, particularly at peak times. And of course, what's a peak time? The sun never sets on Canvas. So, uh, but uh, you know, you probably don't want to try to get in around the middle of the day on the East Coast or something like that. Later in the evening, uh, something like that is is more likely to be a, a shorter wait. I wish we had better news on that, but this situation is rather unprecedented for Canvas as well. The um, I will say that Canvas has been running wonderfully. We've had almost no problems with system performance or crankiness or anything like that. So uh, they've done a, the instructor has done a great job of keeping Canvas running, but they only have so many trained hotline support people, and they couldn't increase that number instantly. So those hotlines are involving a bit of a wait right now. Something you never have to wait for are the Canvas guides. Those are critical tutorials on just about every aspect of Canvas. If you click on that, you'll see that you have both instructor and student guides and others, but those are the two you'd really be worrying about. And the instructor guides, of course, are for you. There's organized by subject and just about everything you'd want to know about Canvas is here. If you want to know how to make a homework assignment, you can just go to assignments and there it is. How do I create an assignment? And you click on it and you've got a wonderful text and, and screenshot tutorial that will take you right through the process of creating an assignment, uh, a homework assignment. The, uh, you can also, with Canvas, just go to Google and type in a question like, how do I upload a file to Canvas? You don't even have to type the whole thing out. And you'll get, inf you'll get more information you ever wanted about how to upload a file to Canvas from Instructure itself and from places as diverse as Lakeland Community College in Florida to Yale. So um, it's never difficult to get help with Canvas. We also have uh, some Canvas tutorials of our own. And those we're adding to those all the time. So uh, all of these things 
will allow you to uh, get help with Canvas. Oh, and also you can file a Canvas support ticket. If you can't get through on the hotline, you can go and file a ticket, a help ticket, uh, and type out your request. And they will get, sometimes you'll hear from them faster that way than waiting on the phone. So lots and lots of help with Canvas. You're also, of course, welcome to contact us. I'll put my email in the chat tool. There it is at the bottom of the chat tool. Remember, you can save that chat log at any time. Uh, the best time, of course, is just before you leave the meeting. But you can save it over and over again. It will just keep adding to it. So a good idea to keep that information handy. Um, in general, in a, on a Canvas screen, you're going to see this system menu over here on the left. And we'll talk about other things in this menu as we go along. Then you'll see a big content frame in the center here where information is going to appear for your students and for you. And then on the right, a variety of things that vary from screen to screen, like um, uh, content, uh, uh, task menus, they're called, uh, and uh, to-do lists and so on. Once you get rolling with Canvas, uh, things, things you need to grade will appear over here, things like that. So the screen basically divided into three parts there. So let's go ahead and access a course. Uh, and I have, let's see, where did I put that? My dashboard's a nightmare. Here we go. This is a shell I've prepared for our use today, a sandbox shell, so we can play with it, do whatever we like with it. And this is what your course shells will look like when you first enter them. This is a blank canvas shell. Uh, the one thing we've really added to the screen in going into the course is this course menu. And there are a bunch of tools um, and, uh, well, tools and links to content and so on over on this side that will be pretty much the same from one course to the next. Uh, and we'll be working with those as we go along. Then we have this content area again in the center, and then our task menu over here on the right. And we'll look at various entries in that uh, as well. The task menu changes from screen to screen. The course menu generally does not. It's about the same throughout the course. The um, first thing we're going to talk about doing in Canvas. Uh, let's see, I'm, I'm just looking at the chat tool here for a second because I saw a good question go by. Would the testing or assessment be confidential so that no one else can access it? Absolutely. Any um, testing, any homework assignments, uh, or submissions, homework assignments, submissions, and so on, are visible only to you and the student who took the test or submitted the homework. Students do not see each other's work. I, well, except in the discussion. The discussion board is meant to be an area where people see each other's posts, their, their uh, information they put on there. But in terms of grades, submissions, test, test attempts, things like that, those are confidential and limited the access is limited only to the student and you, and not something that everyone else can see. And indeed, nothing in your Canvas course, unless you go to a great deal of trouble to make it otherwise, nothing in your Canvas course can be seen by anyone outside your class, because only your students are given access to this shell automatically. You don't have to do anything to make that happen. And as students add and drop, uh, there's not much of that going on at this point in the semester, of course. But as students add and drop, they're, they are added to and removed from your course automatically. 
you don't have to do anything to make that happen. So we're, this course is kind of an empty bucket, a blank sheet of paper upon which we can write our instructional um, intentions for our students. The first thing we'll talk about is how to add content to Canvas, how to put uh, stuff in there that the students can see and read and uh, view and interact with. To do that, we're and, and to share kind of this content with your students, we're going to need to create what are called Canvas modules. A module is just a collection of related links to content, to assessments, to communication tools. And by related content, I mean uh, it, it is content that is concerned with a particular subdivision of your course. It could be like all your PowerPoints in one module and all your lecture notes in another module and all your test review documents in a, yet another module, but that's not usually the way we recommend doing it. Typically, different modules are concerned with different logical subdivisions of your course, depending on how you organ, organize your course logically. For instance, it's easier to show you something like this than it is to just talk about it. So let me pull up a course uh, that has this sort of structure built. Uh, this is a, an old flex, an online flex course I used to offer uh, on the, uh, the multimedia technique of screencasting. And I just use this because it's a conveniently sized, fairly simple, but uh, a Canvas course, but one that contains most of the elements you're going to find in the average Canvas course. And here I, you're looking at my information, my content that I shared with my students, who are you, faculty. Uh, <coughs> each one of these areas, each one of these lists here, separated by white space, are modules. And this is the so-called modules tool. To get to this, students can click on the word modules in the course menu. This is actually by default what automatically comes up when a student or you first enter a Canvas course, assuming it's not a blank course. So uh, here I've got a module that deals with stuff that the students need to know and need to have before, the begin before they start actually working with the course content a getting started or a welcome or an introductory module. And that's fairly standard design. Things like the syllabus, uh, information about the instructor, okay? a welcome page, um, a discussion forum where they can ask questions when I'm not there and I can see them later, a quiz on the syllabus. And uh, that's, that's something left over, I don't need that. <laughs> doesn't make sense, so I'll take it out. Um, so that's fairly a fairly standard organization. And then what follows are a series of content modules representing content or, or providing access to content at different parts of my course. Um, in this case, I've decided to arrange these modules by topic. Uh, this was the first topic I went over. Why bother? Why do this? And then second topic dealt with a couple of specific screencasting tools. And then the remaining topics, the next two dealt with uh, uh, other screencasting tools. And then there was a final project. And then there were some outside readings. Okay. So this was the order in which I 
would present these topics when I taught this face to face. But these modules might also represent, say, the weeks of your course, uh, a week one module, a week two module, and so on. Or a chapter one module in the textbook, chapter two, chapter three. However you logically divide up your course content and uh, activities, you'd have a module for each different part of that uh, subdivision. So that's the general thing we're, we're talking about creating here. This is how information is provided to your students in Canvas. You create modules and you, within the modules you put links to content that you put into Canvas or that you link to from outside of Canvas. So let's see how to do that. It's not very complicated. Uh, I have only eight of the squares on my dashboard. Yeah, that, that's, that's a pretty good <laughs> number. You certainly wouldn't have all the squares that I have. I'm in so many courses on Canvas, my dashboard is a nightmare. Uh, I need to spend some time cleaning it up one day, but I, I do use a lot of those courses from time to time, so I don't want to take them off yet. Uh, but you'll see every, on your dashboard, you'll see every active course, the current course that you're currently enrolled in, either as a teacher or a student. All right. Uh, so let's go back to our blank course and see how we can get started anyway. Create, we can't create all of this, but I'll show you how to do some basics here in terms of adding content to your Canvas course. And uh, I see some people every now and then putting a, a, a question in the chat tool. That's great. I'm kind of trying to keep one eye on that. <laughs> and uh, I'll try to take those questions in context as I can but we do have to kind of keep moving if we're gonna get through all this today, but we're doing okay. But don't hesitate to ask questions. So, um, let's go back to that other course shell that was empty. If I can find it again on my messy dashboard. There we go. My dashboard looks like my real desk and vice versa. Okay, so here's our, our basic, our, our blank Canvas course. So how do we get started loading content into our Canvas course? Well, if you, if you are fortunate enough <laughs> to have a colleague who would share some of their Canvas content with you, you might be able to start by adding existing content. Or maybe you have a publisher who has some basic Canvas content they'd be willing to uh, allow you to use. And they might provide it to you in the form of an importable file that you could just import and boom, you have a start on a Canvas course. That would be nice. Um, in the event of that happy <laughs> situation, you can go to the settings link in the course menu and you can go to import course content in the task menu over here on the right. Let me pull that in a little bit from the right. I know people sometimes have trouble with stuff being over there on the right hand edge. So let me shrink that up a little bit. Uh, import course content. And if the, uh, it, what's you're most likely to have is a Canvas course export package for content type. That is a, a zip file that contains all or part of somebody else's course. And you can just choose the file, take all the content and import it. And bang, you've got at least a start on a Canvas course. But that presumes that you've, you've got a, a, a guardian angel somewhere <laughs> willing to help you get started. But there is an option that you can explore even if you don't have a colleague who teaches your course, who uses Canvas, who's willing to share their content. It's worth asking. And some, some departments have standard shells that they, uh, standard Canvas uh, shells that they hand out uh, for teaching a particular course where you, to help you get started. Obviously you can add your own content and customize it as needed, but uh, at least they can give you a start. 
But there's another resource for that sort of thing as well. And it's over here in the Canvas uh, system menu over on the left. It's the Canvas Commons. This is a fantastic resource, actually, that is um, uh, a collection of uh, online educational content that's been created in Canvas or imported into Canvas by people all over the country and even all over the world, including a lot of our colleagues at the California Community Colleges, because we're the largest organization using Canvas in the world. Shoot, we're the largest educational organization in the world, period. <laughs> so we're definitely the largest Canvas using organization. And there's just a ton of content here, but over 100,000 items in this repository of online learning objects, they call it. In every, just about every subject you can imagine. So you can just come here and search for your subject. Somebody give me a subject. Type it in the chat tool or unmute yourself and speak up. Whoever's English first gets their language. I'm sorry? ESL. ESL. English is a second language. Probably help if I spell it right. Twenty-nine results. That's a manageable number. Thanks. That's a great, <laughs> great example. Okay, these are all items of content that you can pull into your own course, ranging from like a quiz or a module. We just talked about what modules were like a piece of a course, or even entire courses. Matter of fact, there are more <laughs> entire courses than anything else in this case. You can preview these things. This one has, is relatively limited, but we'll just say this will look good. If you decide you'd like this content, you can click this import download button here. This is a very simple process. And then all of the courses that you're enrolled in in Canvas will pop up. Uh, hopefully you won't have that many. Um, let me find one here. Uh, oh, we can just drop, drop it into this one. Let's see, this is Sandbox. And box, where is it? In alphabetical order, I believe. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna. Oh, gee, I don't. I don't want to drop that into this one because it's going to get in the way of what we're going to do. Let me find something here that's safe to drop that into. I'll just drop it into here. Um, just pick the course shell that you'd like to import this into, and click Import into Course. Not much to it. It starts, it runs in the background. You don't have to sit here and wait for it to happen. And in a little while, the content, this content will be in your course shell and ready to use. You can look at it, keep what you want, throw away what you don't. At least it may give you some ideas. And that was just one subject. Again, a hundred, over 100,000 learning objects ranging from complete courses down to individual pages, or pages of information or quizzes, whatever. Marvelous resource. It's worth taking a look if you're trying to, to build content from scratch in Canvas. All right, let's go back to our blank course here that we were fiddling with. Still down at the bottom, isn't it? Sooner or later, nope. Yeah, sooner or later it'll hop up to the top when it figures out I'm actually using it here today. So all of that comes under the heading of adding existing content. But even if you can get a start from some existing content, you're going to have to add some of your own content. Um, and indeed, you may end up wanting to do that anyway, because after all, it's what you teach from. It's something that you want your own content in there that you've used with your students and for years. 
So to do that, you have to start creating the modules in the modules tool. And that's what this second icon on the home page here will do for you. It allows you to create your first module. And all you have to do to create a module is give it a name. And I'm going to call the first module getting, uh, let's call it introduction. Just to be different. <laughs> and click add module. So now I'm in the modules tool over here. If I click on the word modules in the course menu, I'll, I'll be in this same place. And that is also your home location, your course entry point as well by default. This is what people see when they first enter the course. So we got a blank module. That was easy. But let's see how we put stuff in it. Well, it's, the Canvas interface is usually pretty intuitive. If you look at it long enough, hopefully long before beads of blood start to <laughs> break out on your forehead, you'll, you can often figure out what to do next. In this case, we want to add links, the content and links to content to our module. And of course, what do we see here? Well, there's add module, but that would make a new module. Right, we, we haven't added anything to this one yet. But this plus sign right here looks promising because plus equals add, right? And let's see what happens if we click on that plus sign. Indeed, this is the icon that will allow us to add an item to this module. An item being a link to some content or some assessments or some communication tools. Uh, that our students can access through this module. Well, this, what sorts of items can we add? Well, here's the list right here. This add item uh, drop down here. We can add assignments, that'd be homework assignments. Homework assignment being some, usually something that the student would upload a file to Canvas to satisfy. A quiz, self-explanatory. And indeed, you can, you can give almost any kind of quiz on Canvas that you could give on paper in your class, only it never has to hit paper, and the students can take it online at their own time, or at their, on their own schedule, within limits that you set. Um, a file or a page. Uh, we'll talk about the distinction between those in a second, but that's content course content, uh, reading material, videos, um, um, Excel spreadsheets, whatever. Uh, discussion is a dis so-called discussion topic or a discussion forum. It's a place where students can talk about things, discuss things without being online at the same time, like a bulletin board. Um, don't worry about a text header. The other one we'll talk about is uh, today is an external URL, a, a web link, a link to content that's not inside Canvas, that's out on the web somewhere, like a link to the, um, if you were teaching a uh, current affairs course, it might be a link to the CNN website, or to, uh, if you're teaching a course in microbiology right now, you probably have a link to the CDC's uh, coronavirus page or something like that. Those would be external URLs. Uh, URL is a uniform resource locator. It's just the, the web address of a web page or a website out on the web somewhere outside of Canvas. So the, those are all things that you can add to this module. But we're talking right now about adding uh, content. Well, Assuming, accepting that this is a module that's going to contain links to stuff the students need before they start interacting with your course content, per se, stuff that you would cover normally on the first day of class in a physical classroom, what's the first thing you might upload here into this 
introduction module. And yes, from the chat tool, this is indeed an overview of Canvas today, since you just dropped in. You can unmute yourself. Uh, what's the first thing you're probably going to go over in the, on the first in the classroom on the first day of class? Oh, over. I don't know. Syllabus. Syllabus. There's a word. Thank you. Yes, word. <laughs> syllabus. Yeah. How about how about putting your syllabus in here? Well, that's a good idea. Um, your syllabus is probably on a Word document sitting on your local computer, right? Where you, from whence you might print it off and then send it to the uh, uh, print it or, or print it off and send it to uh, Repro Graphics, or you might send just the file and they print it out and run it off for you, and you hand it out to the students and can and class. Well, Canvas, you don't have to put it on paper. You can just upload that syllabus directly to Canvas, and then the students will uh, be able to view it. If they want a paper copy of it, they can download it and print it themselves. But they'll always have it there to read. And they can access this content on Canvas either through a computer or through their mobile devices. Canvas works wonderfully well with mobile devices. Uh, by, mobile, by that, I mean smartphones and tablets like iPads and Android tablets and so on. Students can almost do everything they need to do in a Canvas course. On a, on a smartphone. It's awkward or uh, cumbersome in some cases, but there's not much they can't do in your Canvas course if they're using a smartphone. And I gotta tell you, a lot of them, particularly under these circumstances, a lot of the folks trying to get content out of, uh, view content in your uh, Canvas courses are in fact doing it on their phones because that's all they got. Uh, and, it's the, and they don't have internet at home, many of them, so they're having to go and, and use the, the uh, a cellular connection somewhere or a free, free Wi-Fi, you know, sitting outside the library in the parking lot using the Wi-Fi that leaks through the walls and so on. So it's great that Canvas does work so well on mobile devices, particularly for students. Uh, so your syllabus is probably in a Word file or something similar on your local computer. There are certainly exceptions to that, but let's accept that that's a likely possibility. So I can upload that file to Canvas and create a link to it right here in this module, in this tool that I'm using right now. I can just say I want to add a file to Canvas, and I want to add a new file to it not one that I've already uploaded. So I just click new file and Canvas asks me to choose the file. In other words, tell me where it is on your home, on your local computer. So I just click that choose file button and I look for my syllabus. Oh God, I wonder where I left it. Uh, let's see if I can find it. There it is. Oh, there it is. There's a syllabus. It's a Word document, I can tell from the .docx extension. That's good. But it can be any kind of document, any kind of file. You can upload just about any kind of computer file to Canvas. You do need to be concerned that the students can view, uh, about whether the students can view that file. If it were something extremely esoteric, like, a, say, a, an AutoCAD drawing, uh, the student would have to have AutoCAD on their home computer or some sort of viewer that would pull up an AutoCAD file in order to make use of that content. But you don't have to worry about that with Canvas in terms of most common file types like Microsoft Office documents, PDFs, uh, things like that. Canvas has viewers built in that will display these for students so you don't have to worry about that in most cases. So I'll select that file and I'll just click open. And that tells Canvas which file I want to upload, put up on Canvas, and create a link to at the same time. So I just add the item. 
And in a couple of seconds, there it is. I've added my first bit of content to a module in Canvas. Hence to be a solace. I can clean that up a little bit by going to the context menu at the end of the line here in the module and saying edit. That doesn't let me edit the syllabus, but it will let me edit that name and take off that file extend, uh, extension that looks kind of unfinished, if you will. But it'll work either way. That's, that's cosmetic. Uh, uh, somebody said, oh, I have pages, not Word. Well, you know, that's a, hmm. I haven't tried uploading a pages document to Canvas. That would be a fascinating experience because I'm a PC guy, so I don't have pages, the, the application pages. But I wonder if Canvas has a viewer built into it for a pages document. I'm going to look that up. I'll get back to you on that. But on the other hand, pages can save documents in Word format. And I guarantee you that Canvas will display Word documents clearly. If you were to put a Pages document up on the Canvas and Canvas didn't have a viewer for it built in, then the student would have to download the file to their local computer and open it up. And nobody, well, you can open a Pages file in Microsoft Word if you've set up Word to do so. That's, an, that's a really interesting situation. Right, you can always export a pages file in Word format, but what if you didn't? What if you just put a pages file up there? I'd love to, to know what happens. I, I, I don't have page. Oh, I do. I have it on my smartphone. I want to try that. Okay, cool. I just, that's something for me to learn here today. Dave, I have a yes. question. So I'm, I'm doing the Canvas training and they're saying when we put a link like that, say for a syllabus, uh -huh. when the student clicks on it, they should be able to see it immediately as well as download it. And there's a way to make that happen. And we're about to see that. Okay. Very timely question. All right, good. For the student to see that, all they have to do, they don't see the syllabus here in the modules tool. They just see a link to it. But when they click on it, they get two things. They get a link that will allow them to actually download the file to their local computer and open it up there and print it if they want to. But they also see the document. If it's one of the document types that Canvas has a viewer built in for, this is called a server-side viewer. And it, what it means is that the student will see this document almost immediately without having to wait for it to download to their local computer and then open up Word or some Word viewer. That, that can take quite a few seconds, up to several minutes if it's a very large document for that to happen. Whereas with the viewer that we're seeing here, it generally happens quite quickly. Um, Generally, I say, because if this were a 100 megabyte PowerPoint, and I've seen a few of those lately, uh, it would still take it a while to come up on the screen here, but it would eventually come up. And the student wouldn't even have to have a PowerPoint viewer on their local computer to see it. They just have to wait. Relatively small files like this one come up almost instantly, as you saw. So, uh, putting information up on Canvas in the form of fairly common file types works great for the students. Um, they can see it quickly, they see it clearly, they see everything that's in it, they see the formatting and all that is preserved and whatnot. So not that there's any much formatting in this document. So it works. I mean, you that's incredible power. You can put your syllabus or any other document that you have on your computer up into Canvas, and then your students can come along at any time in the future and click on a link to it, and bam, they'll have that content. They can't lose it. <laughs> they can't lose their copy of it. It'll always be there for them at 2 o'clock in the morning when they're doing their work, 
and when they're viewing your content, it's always there. So it's really cool. And again, they do have the option to click on this link and download the file and keep it on their home computer if they wish. So let's go back to our modules over here in the course menu. And there we are. We've got, a, we've got our first bit of content up there, a file. Uh, there's another common content type that we might add other than files. And again, this, this file could be a Word document, a PowerPoint presentation, a, an Excel spreadsheet, a PDF document, or just about any other type of computer file that you want to share with your students. But you can also share with your students a content type called a page. A page is basically, it's, it's a, a page is also a file. All pages are files, but not all files are pages. <laughs> if that helps any, which I'm sure it doesn't. A, a page is a basically a web page that you create on Canvas, as opposed to creating it offline on your home computer and uploading it to Canvas, like we just did with that syllabus file. And we don't have any pages in here right now, so we have to create a new page. And the first thing we have to do in creating a new page is to give it a name. And let's say we just want to put some welcome information in here. So I'll just call this page welcome and call it Fred if I want to. Apologies if Fred is here. <laughs> and um, so to create a blank page, I just give it a name and click add item and it shows up in the module just like the link to my syllabus did but there's nothing in here in this welcome page yet because we haven't put anything in there i didn't upload something i'd already created i've created an empty page into which i can put content to do that i just click on the name of the page and click the edit button it comes up and now I've got what's called the rich content editor in Canvas. Basically, it's, it's a little uh, limited version of Microsoft Word or another word process or pages or whatever, a, a basic text and graphics editor that will allow you to type content like welcome to introduction to I won't type too much today. I'm terrible at it. Mother told me to learn how to type. I can do all the usual text editing stuff. I can center it. I can bold it, I can italicize it. I can make it bigger. Like so. So I can type in here to my heart's content. I can also put pictures in. Uh, here's the embed image tool in the rich content editor. And this is a little bit confusing. You're never going to pull an image off the web doing this. You're going to upload the image to Canvas off your home computer in all probability. So you use that central tab there. And you're going to put it in course files which is your file space for this course. You get a gigabyte by default, you get a gigabyte of file space in each Canvas shell. So that's a lot of documents. My files is a personal file space for stuff that you, that's outside of any particular course. So usually you'll select at this point course files, tell Canvas where to put this page. And then when you click on course files, this little button that says upload file, lights up and you click on that and you look in your pictures on your local computer for something that might be appropriate here let's see let's scroll through and look for it aha uh -huh. there's our online learning pathways logo i'll use that I'll click open to tell Canvas, and that Canvas just uploaded that file 
to your to the file space for this course in Canvas. I do need to give that file some alt text. Uh, this is going to be a picture, a graphic, static graphic. And a blind student who's using a screen reader is going to come to the screen reader software is going to come to this and the screen reader can't look at a picture and describe it. So you have to provide a description for that picture for the blind student in order to keep your course accessible, which is <laughs> required by so many different organizations and polities and groups now that I, I don't even want to talk about. Um, and this is the online learning pathways logo. So I have to tell Canvas what this picture is. It can't figure it out either. I can just update that and oops, I sort of put that on the same line. I didn't mean to. So there it is. There's that logo. What else might we want to put here? Well, we might put a, a video. Uh, it's real easy to embed videos in the Canvas, into a Canvas page. Canvas page can contain text, static graphics, videos, links to content both inside and outside of Canvas, and other stuff as well. Well, let's say we have a video, a welcome video for this course. Well, we can do that. Um, in order to import that video, I would use this, or to embed this video, I would use this insert edit media tool here, the second icon in the second line of the control bars on in the rich content editor. And um, it's asking for the web address. We assume this video has to be online. You can upload video files directly to Canvas and access and embed those or and put links to those inside Canvas pages. But we strongly recommend against that because Canvas is not designed as a video server. It has limited capacity in that regard, and you don't have enough space in your course to put a lot of videos on it. So typically these videos will be online somewhere already. And we just need to connect them to Canvas so that the students can click on something in Canvas and view the video. And the most likely place to find video that you can use for free is on YouTube. Let's see. Let me get to the opening page of YouTube here. It's in the middle of something else there. Okay, here's YouTube. And if it's a video that you that's not yours, but that you want to use in your course, it's perfectly fine. You just search for it on YouTube. You can search by subject area. And you can find videos from uh, everybody from uh, questionable political organizations to Berkeley, you can, uh, University of California, Berkeley on here. I mean, there's, there's billions and billions of videos on YouTube. Many of them of great instructional value. They're not all videos of cats writing uh, automatic vacuum cleaners. So, um, but it may well be a video that you have put up on YouTube that you want to use. In that event, you go to your YouTube studio. And I'm not trying to show you how to use YouTube here. I'm just trying to give you an idea of what's possible. And I can go to my video list. <coughs> And I can search for, I've got a welcome video somewhere. What do you mean, the video zero? Did I misspell welcome? No. Oh, don't get cranky on me, YouTube. There it is. Oh, it was intro to screencasting. That was a failure in my database, not YouTube's. <laughs> okay, that'll do. Um, I can get from that video by clicking on the details page, the link to that, the web link, the URL for that video, which I can then copy to my clipboard. 
and I can go back to Canvas, and I can paste that right here in this box labeled Source. And then click OK, and bada bing. That's what's called a video embed. It's basically a fancy link. I did not actually load that video on the canvas. All this does is give the students a place to click and have that video play directly from YouTube. So Google pays for the storage and the bandwidth and so on, rather than Canvas or the San Diego Community College District. Such a deal. So the students can just click on that and play it. Hi, everyone, and welcome to introduction. A little less hair there. Okay, so that's all there is to putting a video up on Canvas. And if you embed it in a Canvas page like this, you miss most of the advertising on YouTube. So it's less distracting for your students. <coughs> you can also put links to stuff in Canvas or outside of Canvas. I could put a link here to uh, Oh, uh, CNN. Just by typing some words, highlighting it, clicking the link to URL, the, web, the hyperlink button, and typing in the, I use CNN because it's short and real easy to type. <laughs> Not any ideological <laughs> orientation, okay? It's easy. So there's a link to the CNN website for whatever reason. You can also put links to internal content in Canvas um, by, again, highlighting this and using the internal link tab over here on the right of the content editor. I can go to uh, course navigation, for instance, and I can send the students that they click on this link anywhere in the course, in this case, to the modules page. If I scroll all the way down, I can. I just click on modules here, and bang, that becomes a link. So if I save this page now, the students, can, we can go back to our module, and the student can click on this welcome item here, and there's that page. They can play the video, they can go to CNN, they can go right back to their course modules, which is where we just were. That's just a, a small sampling of things you can put into a Canvas page, so, but you can put just about any content in there, ranging from just some basic welcome information like I've done, all the way up to complete sets of lecture notes, uh, reading assignments links to content all over the web. Everything can be put in there. So in order to build our course, we just keep this up. We keep adding content and modules uh, to the course until we've got everything in there that we need our students to access in order to meet our goals. Eventually, of course, we'll have to build another module not everything is going to go into that introduction module. So let's say I might have a, a topic one module. I'll just call that why screencasting and click add. Okay, there's now I've got a my first content module, my first subject module. This you're now we're going to start loading course content in. And um I'm going to show one more example of how to load content. We've seen how to load a file and how to create a Canvas page. The third type of content that you might add is an external link, a web link. You start the same way by clicking the plus sign for that module, the add item icon. And in this case, I'm going to add an external URL or a web link to this module. And to do that, I just need to, a name for the link and the web address, the URL for the content that I want to appear, or that I want to link to. 
Well, I happen to know that there's a, uh, out here on the web, there's a great guide to screencasting from the company TechSmith, which is they're the people who practically invented the technique. And uh, screencasting guide. You can just search for content that you need on the web and find it. And let's see, there it is, the ultimate guide. What is screencasting and how do you do it? Well, if I click on that, I can go to that link. And here is the URL for it up here in the location line on my web browser. So I can just copy that and go back to Canvas and paste that into the URL box here and then name it so that students know what it is and, to, and that it's worth clicking on. Generally, I like to load web links in a new page. It makes it easier for the student to get back to where they were in Canvas. Add the item. Now I've got a, got a link to that. The student can then come in and just click on that link and pop a block. What? Ah, here we go. Open guide to screencasting in a new window. There we go. And there it is. And there's just massive amounts of information out on the web you can use that way. And if somebody posts it on a public website, you can use it. So we've just begun to create some modules here. But everything that you would do from this point is just basically going to be a repetition of this. The, the, as far as the mechanics of creating links and loading content in the Canvas are concerned, you've seen how to do all the major content types. And it's just a matter of doing the same things over and over again. Obviously, that's the hard part is figuring out finding the content or deciding what content you have to use and how to organize it and how to put it in and how to and what how many modules you need and what each module needs to cover and so on but uh the the nuts and bolts the mechanics of getting the content in the canvas are really pretty repetitive and pretty simple so it'd just be a matter of continuing as we started here Let's see. Um, let's see. How's it? I'm just looking at some of the questions, sorry, in the chat tool, because I saw some good stuff going by there. Uh, how would you uh, deal with a site like Spelling City? Well, you probably just link to it. Uh, is content if it's content that's provided by someone else you just link to it and it would send the students out to their website but if you open it in a new tab like i did with this one then they can easily get back to canvas when they're done what if i need a photo or a work of art from the internet well it's real easy to go get it <laughs> the question is is it copyrighted and can, can you legally use it that's a the question is sort of beyond the scope of this introduction. Um, generally, if it's on a public website, you can get away with linking to it. But copying a picture off of a public website and inserting it into Canvas is much less, it's much less clear that that's legal. Not that it's not really easy to do. But um, so best thing to do is send the students to the site where it's already uh, displayed. Then you don't have to worry because then it's the people who display who are displaying it who have to worry about the copyright issues, not you. Why did you not just use the YouTube link? Ah, and boy, I love it. When somebody answers their own question, ah, the distractibility factor, yes. I could just put in a link to a YouTube video. That is certainly a, a very easy thing to do. But when you do that, 
you send them to YouTube. And there are 16 videos down the right-hand side of the page, all of which, if, I, if it's my video, all of those are more interesting than my video <laughs> and certainly more attractive. You know, none of my videos have anybody wearing a thong in them, okay? So, uh, yeah, if you embed the video in a Canvas page, you reduce the distractions for your students. There's even a way to prevent YouTube from flashing up those, those suggested videos when the, video's in, when the video quits playing. You can prevent that from happening if you embed the video into Canvas. So embedding the video is a really good idea for a number of reasons. Is there a pro-con to adding a link as opposed to an embed of the link? Well, we just talked about some of those reasons. Another reason is that the embed, you know, this, is, this link is not very sexy looking. The students are gonna have, need some extra motivation to click on that. Uh, on the other hand, in this welcome page here, well, there's nothing sexy here either, but at least it's a little more appealing. You can see what, you get some idea of what the video is about and uh, what it's, um, you know, you get some connection with the person who's in the video and whatnot. So I think embeds are a little bit more likely to be used. They kind of draw people in as opposed to just clicking on a link. So embed, I like to embed video in Canvas pages when I use it, if I possibly can. Uh, I will, uh, and so, some of the rest of this we're gonna get to in a little while, so I'm gonna move on here. Uh, babe, right. babe. Yes, I'll, absolutely. I'll how can again i know you went over yesterday but how do i put a video into the module i th think i got it but i ended up didn't know where to go after i got it in there can you explain that well uh the you could just put a link to the video right here into the module add a web link or a, an external url sorry I'm still living in Blackboard. And I can just, let's see if I still have that video URL. Yeah, I do. No, that's the blog. That's the, uh, the guide. Let me get that uh, video URL again here. Okay. I could just put that in here. And uh, this is a YouTube video. Welcome. I want to load it in a new tab, add the item. Well, that you can do that. And you just click on that. But that sends, again, sends the students to YouTube. And look at all this stuff over here. All of Hi, this everyone. is more interesting than welcome to it. So better to, I like it better to go ahead and uh, embed that video in a Canvas page which is what you see here in this welcome page. But either one will work. Okay, thank you. You bet. For uh, educational, yeah. per yes. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. How can I connect uh, a page in a module and I wanted to use um, hyperlink? Um, well, we've just seen how to put a hyperlink into a module, a, a web link. Um, a page you just create within the module. And the page itself can contain hyperlinks, like this link to CNN here, which I created using this link to URL tool by just highlighting the text. So I'm not sure. So how can you create page within the module? Yeah, and the page is in the module. It's linked to the module. It doesn't actually reside in the module, technically. What you have here is a link to it. The page actually lives in the pages tool. 
in uh, oh, I don't understand that part. So you go to module and then you create a page in the module. Yeah, you can create a page right from the module. And in the process, you also create a link to the page at well, the same time. Yeah. I want to create the link to the page, yeah. Yeah. So when you create a page in the module, you also create a link to it at the same time. You don't have to do that in two separate steps. And works every time, saves you time. Though you could also go to the pages tool and add and create a page here and then link it into the module separately. But why do why do two things when you can do everything at once? By just starting in the modules tool and adding pages to the modules tool. New page, and you get a blank page, and you, then you start adding content to it. For educational purposes, is it all right to copy a photo or a work of art as long as it's only 2% of the artist's work? No, unfortunately not. You can argue fair use. Uh, we don't have time for a, an in-depth discussion of copyright, and I am not a copyright lawyer, so you would want to take anything I say with a grain of salt anyway. But no, there are no blanket generally no blanket exceptions to copyright for educational use. And fair use is, a, is an, an iffy business. Copyright law is made on, in, on a case by case basis. So the only way you can be sure that something you're doing is fair use is to get sued for it and win, which is probably not worth it. What is the link next to the link icon? I'm not sure. Uh, oh, perhaps this you're talking about. These are movement tools. Uh, for instance, this welcome video or welcome page here, excuse me, um, might better be up above, might be the first thing. And I can just click and drag on that movement tool and I can move stuff around. I can even move videos or I can even move links from one module to another that way. Or I can move modules around that way. Good question. All right. Uh, in addition to course content, we also in can have means in Canvas to assess our students. We can create quizzes and have them take the quizzes online. We can assign them homework and have them turn the homework in online through Canvas. Um, so, and we can put links to those assessments right here in our modules. Indeed, we can create the assessments right here from the module. For instance, um, I can go to topic one here and I can add a quiz to this module. I don't have any quizzes yet, so I'll make that a new quiz. We'll give it a name. How about why screencasting quiz, topic quiz. Maybe we even spell that right. Okay. Um, and then add the item. This is a blank quiz, like we had a blank page before. I can click on that uh, link and go to uh, my empty blank quiz and edit it and add content to it. I have two tabs on this quiz editing page. One is details and the other questions up here at the top. The details page is my test options. Uh, things like instructions. Uh, hopefully you might be a little more eloquent than that. Um, and then we can set properties for the quiz, like whether it's graded or not. Well, usually they are. We don't worry about assignment groups. I don't recommend shuffle answers. 
We can set a time limit for the quiz. We can decide whether the student gets to take it once or multiple times. We can decide when students get to see feedback, when they get, to, when they get their test paper back, and how much information is on it. We can't go into great detail here because we don't have time, but we do, in a, we do a complete two-hour session just on assessments where we go into this in much more detail. Um, we can uh, set due dates and available until dates after which the student can take the test. And we can decide when the students first are allowed to get into the test. Then we can add questions to the test, and the test is not much good without questions. Uh, we can type questions directly into Canvas by clicking Add New Question here. Um, and these are all the different question types you can create in Canvas multiple choice being the most common, but by means, by no means the only kind. True, false, fill in blank and blanks, multiple answers, boys, students hate those, multiple choice questions with more than one right answer, or potentially more than one right answer. Uh, the best objective question type there is, but prepare for large groups of students with torches and pitchforks outside your door if you use those a lot. Multiple drop downs is a esoteric type matching, numerical answer, compute something and get an answer and pick it out of a list. Those are all objective question types that Canvas can grade. When you create the question, you tell Canvas what the right answer is and Canvas grades it for you. No more Scantron sheets. No more answer keys, you know, lining up over the over an answer sheet. <laughs> mark, 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 none of that. Canvas, Canvas does that for you instantly. Yes. Uh-huh. I was just saying amen to no more Scantron sheets. Oh, yeah, no more Scantron sheets. Hey! <laughs> um, uh, but you can also have subjective questions and essay questions, probably, or file upload questions, which are kind of like homework assignments where the student has to upload a file to answer the question. Um, those you have to grade yourself, but objective questions, Canvas will grade for you. So let's like, uh, let's ask something like, um, which of following is a screen casting tool? Don't worry about the content, but that you just type the text of the question in the question text box. And then you've got possible answers down here. And you type those in. Are they ever popular? All of the above. My students learn very quickly that in my youth that I loved all of the above. And uh, <laughs> If you didn't know the answer to the question, you always picked all of the above, and at least 60% of the time you got it right. Oh, well. Yeah, that's the right answer, so I have to tell Canvas that's the right answer. Uh, on the day that Canvas can figure that out, we're all out of a job, so we hope that doesn't happen anytime soon. Um, okay. And then I can just update the question to put it into the test. And now I just keep going. It's just like typing a test in Word, only it's a little quicker because you don't have to worry about the formatting. Canvas, Canvas handles that. So you can create tests from scratch quite quickly in Canvas. If you are fortunate enough to have test banks or question banks from a publisher or from a colleague or some that you've made yourself, you can find the questions. And I do have some some uh, questions, qu question tools in this uh, shell that I secreted away in, in preparation for this demonstration. There's a question pool that came from Blackboard, it looks like, uh, with uh, some questions in it. So I can click on that and I get some questions here that I can pick. Um, bada bing, bada bing. I just pick a couple at random. 
and add them. So now those questions are part of my test. Boy, that was a lot more fun. <laughs> it's nice to have question banks. So you can pick questions specifically out of question banks that every student is going to get. Or you can also do what's called add a question group, which is a way to have Canvas randomly pull questions out of a question bank for you so that each student gets a different test. They get the same number of questions by, from that bank, but no two students will get exactly, um, exactly the same set of questions, or it's unlikely that they would. You can do that just by adding a question group, giving it a name. Doesn't matter what you call it, really. You can tell Canvas which question bank to use. This one's got seven questions. I'll use it. Of course, I already picked a couple out of there, so I may get some duplications, but what the heck. Select the bank. And now Canvas knows which bank to pull from. And let's say I want it to pull two questions for each student. And I want each question maybe to have be worth two points, or not 12 points, two points. And I can, I can uh, create the group. And now let's just save that test and preview it. And there are, there, there's the question I entered manually. Here are the two questions that I selected. And here are two questions pulled at random from the uh, test bank. I go back to the module and there's a link to that quiz and the student can click on that link and take the quiz. They won't see what I'm saying. If you want to see what your students see, you go to home and you click student view and they'll see the course as you, uh, then you'll see the course as the students do. Wait a minute, there are no modules. Didn't we just add modules? What happened? Oh my God, did Canvas throw them away? No, Canvas doesn't throw stuff away. I'll have a friend, I had a frantic faculty member earlier today who will remain nameless, who um, thought that Canvas had thrown away all the grades on the tests that her, her students took yesterday. It just doesn't happen. Canvas was messing with her <laughs> because she'd done something a little bit out of order and, and Canvas hid the, quest, hid the grades from her in a snit. <laughs> uh, but Canvas will not throw stuff away. There are no modules showing up here because I screwed up. Anybody know what I screwed up? No. You didn't save it? I saved it. It's still there, see? You didn't publish it. Ah, that's the word. I didn't publish it. I did that deliberately, right? <laughs> or did I just forget? You'll never know. At I least I'm learning it. something. <laughs> um, publish in Canvas means make it visible to students. So I didn't make this visible to students. Neither one of these modules is published. I can tell because this little icon right here is a circle with a slash through it. That means it's not published. If I click on that link, uh, on that circle, that publishes it. And as indicated by a, a green circle with a white check mark in it. And if I publish a module, by default, everything within the module is published. Though I can unpublish stuff within the module if I don't want the students to see it right away. But I do want them to see that quiz. So now if I go over to the home button and click uh, student view, now the student sees all of that. And they can go and they can take that quiz, except that I made it available April 20th at 12 a.m. Well, I really did screw up that time. <laughs> the student can't take that yet because it's not time. But once they, once time has arrived, the student will see basically this, what you see when you click preview. 
and they'll be able to answer the questions. Essay questions they can type in. Uh, other questions they can select uh, radio buttons. Or, oops, sorry about that. Didn't mean to turn that off. Pardon me. So they can just take the quiz and submit it. And uh, Dave, this yeah. class is is very hard and confusing for novices, and I'm a novice at this. <laughs> I understand, but we're having to hit the high spots as we go okay. through. Okay. And if I spend too much time on any one, I won't get everything covered. So yes. the idea is that you'll have this to go back to because I am recording this. You'll have this to go back to and think about. Uh, and with a little more time. I know I'm having to move fairly quickly through this, but we're already at three hours and 38 minutes, or uh, two, uh, an hour and 38 minutes in, and I really don't want to keep you over time. So, um, yeah, Thank there you. is a, a lot of background here, but going back through it and looking at it again and being able to stop it and start it and so on will hopefully help. So, uh, there we go. We've made a quiz which students can take. And you can find the grades online. There's my test student. Oh, I didn't actually have the test student take that, did I? But you could go to your grade book, which is the grades tool here. And you would find your students and your assessments. And you could go and if the tests were all uh, objective, you would see the grade here. If it were not, you would be able to go into the test and grade the essay questions or whatever other uh, subjective questions were in there, and then add that grade to it and move on. If we have a minute here at the end, I will have that student take that test and uh, then show you how that works. But again, we do an entire session on grading. But this is where you would find your grades, under the grades tool in the course menu. We can also, in our modules, create uh, homework assignments. Same, start off the same way every time. We click that add button in the course module. And we click, in this case, assignment first option in the menu. This is a homework assignment. This is something that probably the student will satisfy by creating a computer file offline on their local device and then uploading that to Canvas. We'll create a new assignment, give it a name. I'm going to call this Define Screencasting and add it to the module just as we've done before and click define and then this is a blank assignment so i click on it just as i've done with the page and the quiz before and edit it and let's say uh that's the name of the assignment but here i have a box to put instructions and in to tell the students what i want them to do to satisfy this assignment and how about write a definition of, and thank God there is spell check, <laughs> a definition of screencasting, including applications of the technique and tools required for screen or I'm just making this up as I go along. Upload your answer in a Word document. Because even if you got pages, as somebody quite correctly pointed out in the chat tool earlier, you can save, you're going to export a pages document as a Word document. 
because maybe your teacher doesn't have pages. Um, then you just give it a number of points. Uh, you tell Canvas how students are going to submit it, submission type. Uh, our, about our only option right now is online. We, they can't give it to us on paper unless they mail it to us. I suppose that's conceivable, but uh, unlikely under the circumstances. But most likely they're going to submit it online at this point in time. And if they submit it online, we can give them the option to either type it into Canvas in real time while they're uh, submitting the assignment, they can type this in, or more likely we can allow them to upload it in a file that they have created um, off, uh, before they went to submit the assignment on their local computer. And if we, uh, if we select a file upload, we can even restrict the type of uh, files that we'll accept, like only Word documents. <laughs> since we said, since I said up here, uploaded as a Word document, not a document. Um, this will prevent them from uploading anything else. <laughs> so you don't get files that you can't open. You can, if it's a writing assignment, you can have it reviewed for plagiarism by Unicheck. Uh, and you can set, like we could with the, uh, with the uh, quiz, we can set due dates and availability dates. And that's all there is to an assignment, is the instructions and the points and a few options about how they turn it in. And yeah. bang. Yeah, and we can save and publish it at the same time. Yes. This is Tessie again. I'm still at the same place I was at yesterday. And that is I'm trying to take this training program to uh, qualify myself to be able to teach online classes. And right. when I when I call in for help, the guys because all my modules are I'm all my Chairs are there with the classes that I have and what I'm supposed to be teaching now, which is cancer. And so on um, this module um, for, this, um, for this class, it says I'm supposed to put in the discussion, introduction, and the icebreaker, and then I'm to write an assignment in module one and all that stuff. And it's like he gave me, he had me put this stuff like I was actually teaching the class, so it got me really confused. So here I am in the same spot I was yesterday. I didn't see oh, that. Oh, boy, and, course, nah. and I am sorry, and that's not what we're covering today. We're not talking about that training. I know that's not what we covered, but I just need to, I know, I just no, need I, to get on. I, under, I, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying, and, I, and you haven't heard back on that yet. Um, let, I, think you copied, me I think you copied me on that, so too. Like, I, don't know, I don't know who to go to. Yeah, well, I think you copied me on that email as well. So I will take a look at that. I, I was expecting you'd hear back from the people who are running that course, but I will take a look at that and okay. see if I can help as well. Okay. I really appreciate it because I'm, I'm with you every day. <laughs> I understand. I will do my best. Okay, so um, uh, so we have an assignment. Uh, it, this one is currently, I published it when I saved it. You can do that at the same time. So it's in, a, in that module. The student can see that now. Yeah, we got the green circle there. If I go to the student view, and I go to the modules, there's that... Uh, homework assignment and I have a button to submit the assignment. I can, the student can click on that and they get an option to upload the file. Upload a file. Well, let's see if this student has that done. I, you would choose the file and find it. <laughs> the student would find it on his or her computer. Let's see if we can find that. There it is. There's a definition of screencasting as a Word document. Click open. 
And uh, if it if I needed to add another file, I could. Otherwise, I just submit the assignment. So that's all there is for the student to do in Canvas. Obviously, the process of creating the Word document to upload is a little bit more uh, complicated. But um, the mechanics of submitting an assignment in Canvas for the student are very minimal. And for you, you can go to grades. And there's that assignment submission. That's what that little icon means. It means that the test student, who is you when you go into student view, uh, has submitted a, a file to satisfy this defined screencasting assignment. And you can click on that little icon and click the right <laughs> arrow here. And we have tutorials for all of this, of course, as well as recordings of this session. Of, earlier versions of this session, ad infinitum. There must be about 10 of them on our site. Yes. Right now. Isn't it? Right? <laughs> Bless your heart. Oh, I'm so and, sorry. Uh, I didn't even know I was so. No, not you. to worry. <laughs> I and, it, and it's allergy. I trust it's allergies and not <laughs> anything worse. I've got yes, this yes, it's allergies. right now. It's allergies. Yeah, no, Thank good. you. Good. Good. Uh, we could go to what's called the speed grader which is the grading interface in Canvas. And I can read, yeah, 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 that looks actually pretty good. It's got everything except the tools in it. So maybe that's worth an eight out of 10. I can just enter the grade. I can give comments. I can type comments. I can, up, I can upload a file that has comments in it. I can even leave them a little video or I can do my favorite thing if I'm in Word, or if I'm in can, uh, Chrome, I can speak a comment and Chrome will type it for me. <coughs> pretty, pretty good answer, but you forgot the tools. Eight out of 10. That's, that might be my favorite thing in Canvas. <laughs> so I can, I can just speak comments, and it, you notice it's quite, uh, quite accurate. And you can, I could have even put a period at the end if I'd said period. Um, and submit that, and the grade appears in the grade book. I see it here in my grade book, and the student would see it in their uh, grades tool. They have a grades link too. I go to student view, click on grades. There it is. They got a score eight out of 10. And they can see the feedback I gave them and so on. So it's an end-to-end -end communication thing. And I can leave student view and I can be me again. So that's all there is to creating homework assignments in Canvas. The third type of assessment you might use, which is also a communication tool, which is the last thing we'll talk about, is a discussion. Discussions like a bulletin board. You post stuff on a bulletin board and everybody can see it. And they can paste, then they can reply to it by sticking a note right before your, right below your note. And you can get whole strings of discussions going that way. That's how a discussion board works. Uh, to show you what a discussion board looks like, I need to go to a course that already has one in it because we don't have time to recreate all that here. So let's go to this one and go to discussions. And here's what a typical discussion looks like. At the top, you provide some guidance on what to discuss. So here I've asked them to post three ideas for instructional applications of, an, of a piece of software called Camtasia in their subject area. And then 
reply and comment on other people's posts. So this student, Bullwinkle J. Moose, has, post, has followed the directions, good moose, and listed three ideas for instructional applications for this software. And this student, Boris, has come along and read that and had a question. So he replied to the, to the student's, first student's reply and asked a question. And then the first student came back again and answered and replied to his reply and answered it. And then Boris came back and Boris did followed the instructions here as well and, re and replied to my com my initial instructions using that button and so on and you get this long string of posts long string of notes if you will that everyone can read and they're arranged in what are called threads by default because these posts are all three related to one another. This was this student's original post, then this one asked a question, then this one answered it, and then the first one answered it again. That's a discussion thread. It's a, a real discussion going on. Very rich, very extended, doesn't take any class time out of your precious lecture time if you have a face-to-face -face interaction with the students. And sometimes people who are very reluctant to speak up in class will, will function very nicely in a discussion forum like this. So you can have real, rich, extensive class discussions here, even better than the ones you can have face-to-face -face in class because you simply don't have time in class to spend that much of it on a, on a, a, a very rich, rollicking discussion. So. It's a great tool. And these can be graded. If we edit this, if we check the option to make it graded, then you can assign a grade to each student's participation in the, uh, in the discussion form, class participation. And you can do it very rationally rather than just trying to remember, well, it seemed like that student spoke up in class quite a few times. I'll give him full credit, or this student didn't ever say anything, so I won't give her anything. And yet this student uh, over here was fairly active, so I'll give it, you, know, you don't have to go back and try to remember that or jot things down. It's all captured by Canvas. You can go back and evaluate it rationally and consistently for all the students later on. Uh, Oh, that would be nice. Somebody asked, can you speak notes like a whole module? No, unfortunately, I think that tool only works in the speed grader, darn it, because they had to integrate it with Canvas there. there though there are uh, tools that you can buy, like Dragon Naturally Speaking, that would allow you to do that. And actually, Windows has a speech to text process built in, but I don't know if you can integrate that with Canvas or not. I haven't tried that. Would be nice to be able to just create all your documents that way. And you certainly can create like a Word document that way. Windows has that built in, and I, the Mac does too, uh, speech recognition. It may not be quite as good as what you saw here, but you, you could at least get most of your document done that way. And I'm gonna get back to all these questions before, we, before I leave here. But there are a couple of things yet that I need to talk about with you. We've seen how to do communication. Oh, the announcements are good communications tools in Canvas. You just add an announcement. It's like put a subject and a message and save it. And everybody sees it Excuse when me. they go in. Yes. Um, if you put it in announcements, they have to go through Canvas to see it. They can't, it doesn't go directly to their email, right? Maybe. <laughs> I'm, I'm not trying to be facetious. It depends on their, what are called their notification settings. If you make an announcement, they can go to the announcements tool 
in Canvas and see it. You're correct. Also, by default, if you create an announcement and you have an opening page in Canvas, the, uh, the first three or the last three, I should say, announcements that you posted will appear at the top of the page when they first come into the course. So they don't necessarily even have to click on the announcements button to see the announcements. And they may get an email from Canvas that says an announcement has just been posted in your course. Click here to go view it. Oh. But that depends on their notification settings, which you can't set for them. Notifications are set in the account button in Canvas. And there are a series of course activities that can trigger announcements or notifications by email or other means. And the student has to select that. I believe that announcement is usually selected so that they get an, an immediate notification of an announcement, but that's they can turn default. that off. That's a default. I think that's the default, but it doesn't mean they haven't turned it off because Canvas can get quite chatty and they say, I don't want to hear that. And they go in and if they know what to do, they can just turn that off. And Dave, so I get announcements. Can't, can't depend every, on it. I get announcements every day, a whole lot of them. And I'm wondering if how can I turn some of them off that I don't want to know. Right here. Right here. Go to your account button. Well, while you're in Canvas, go to your account button and go to notifications. And okay. you'll probably just see one column here with your email address. Yes. And if you want to see an announcement like for a, a notification, like for an announcement, you click the check mark. Okay. If you don't want to see it, you click the X. Okay. If you want to get a daily summary, you click the little clock. And if you're going to get one email a week from Canvas with all the notifications in it of that event, you click this little calendar icon. That'll give you a once a week email. For announcements. Okay. okay so you I can, get them every day a lot though. Yeah, you can you can go in there and you can shut them off. <laughs> okay, thank you. You bet. Good question. Okay. Um, so announcements is a good communication tool. Your inbox is an email system that will allow you to communicate with your students by email or by messaging. Your messages, your Canvas messages that come into your Canvas inbox appear here on the left. You can read those just like you would any other email. They may, they may have come from students, from colleagues, from whomever, any, any user in Canvas can send emails or Canvas messages. Uh, you send a message by clicking on this little button here that says compose a new message. You have to select the course that you want to send to. And for some reason, this is a little twitchy on my computer. I've never quite figured out why. There we go. I got way too many courses. Hopefully you won't be cursed with that many, at least not right away. There we go. And I can select recipients by clicking this little person button out here to the right. I could send like to students. I could send to all students, or I could send to individual students if I wanted to. Just put in a subject. If I've sent to a lot of people, I can click send an individual message to each recipient. And that basically means a blind carbon copy. They won't see everybody else who got the message as well. And then just click send. That message goes to the student's Canvas inbox. They have an inbox just like yours. They can see that then over here on the left side of their inbox tool. 
but it also gets sent on, forwarded on to their personal external email account that is registered with Canvas, which is the one that they have registered with the district by, by automatic transfer. When they, if they reply to you, it will come back to your Canvas inbox, but then it will also go back to your personal email address that is registered with Canvas, which again is the, usually the one that uh, you have, the default email address that you have registered with the district uh, through PeopleSoft. You can change the email address that you use with Canvas if you wish. But it's an end-to-end -end messaging tool. So you get, if you send them a message, they not only get it in Canvas, they also get it even if they're not logging into Canvas. It'll go to their personal email. So you have a better chance of getting their attention than with an announcement. And that's guaranteed. No matter what their notification settings are set to, they will get an email that you send them, assuming they're checking that account. So that's another communication tool. And the third communication tool, a big one, here are the discussion forms that we've already looked at. So <laughs> we've covered all three of the major things you can do with Canvas. You can put content in the Canvas that you can share with your students. You can assess your students through quizzes or homework assignments or graded discussions. And you can communicate with your students asynchronously you don't have to be online at the same time, through announcements, through the inbox, and through discussions. <coughs> and if you can do all that, you can pretty much do what you need to do with Canvas. Now, we haven't covered every detail about Canvas, for sure. <laughs> but I hope I've given you enough of a start that you can figure out uh, what you need to do, or at least figure out the questions you need to ask. And that's what we're here for, is to answer those questions. I put my email address in that chat log early on. Remember, you can save that. Just click on the little button in the lower right-hand corner with the three dots, so the lower right-hand corner of the chat window. With the three dots, click on that and save the chat. You've got my email address. You've got some other links that you may need. And everybody's questions. And now I'm going to take questions. I've been trying to take them as we've gone along. But now I'm going to make sure there's nothing in the chat log that I haven't answered. And then I'll take any other questions you have on any topic, not just Canvas, but any topic that you want to ask questions on that having to do with remote or online um, uh, instruction. Uh, let's see. Uh, what is the best way to give students simple and easy access to Canvas, especially seniors? Here. <laughs> um, the three things they need to know in order to get into Canvas are the URL. The, the address for Canvas, sdccd.instructure.com, and their username and their password. And if they have that and they can get to Canvas, I think you're going to find that they're going to be they're probably not going to have a lot of trouble figuring out what to do next. I was the, uh, we, we had a, an extended pilot period with Canvas because PeopleSoft wasn't ready. We couldn't start using Canvas until it was integrated with PeopleSoft. Couldn't get the students into their classes and things like that. So we had about a year where we were using Canvas for some, a small number of classes with real students, but we, we couldn't implement it fully. And I was the primary support contact for both faculty and students during that trial period, that pilot period. And I swear I can count on my fingers and toes the number of times, and, and we had hundreds of students, because we had like 12 or 13 classes each semester. There were literally hundreds of students in Canvas each semester 
who might have asked questions of me. And I had my email address everywhere for them and so on. And maybe I, I got maybe 10 to 20 questions during three, yeah, it was three semesters from hundreds and hundreds of students. I got maybe 10 to 20 questions about Canvas that weren't, how do I log in? <laughs> or what's my password? Uh, substantive questions about Canvas were almost unknown because students just get it. It's very intuitive, much more so than Blackboard. If the course is well designed, the students generally don't have much trouble. And if they do, they've got all those ways to get help. They've got that number they can call 24 seven, at least before all this happened, it was easy to get through on. If they're persistent, they can still get through. They've got the Canvas guides, they've got our tutorials, um, and they've got you, of course, for, for questions that are within your uh, uh, field of vision, as it were. So we don't tend to have uh, much, many issues from students of any age. Once we get them into Canvas and they've figured out where everything is. Um, so that's some hope uh, that we can give you. Uh, but you can give them that basic information they need just in an email. And you can email them right through Canvas. So Dave? Yes. Do they, they have to be registered in a class before you can, um, before they can access the Canvas shell. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. Or there has to be some other provision made. We have some situations where uh, shells are used for non instructional purposes and we can actually put the people in manually. Uh, and you can add people to your class manually. Uh, no, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, let me let me log in as a uh, in, instructor me. This is a, a, a login with no administrative privileges. I can go to my introduction to screencasting class. I can go to people in the course menu. I can add people. And if I know their login ID, I can just put it in. I think that one's in there. And I can put them in as a student, a teacher, TA, whatever. So if I have their CSID number and their birth date, I can just add students through Canvas? Yes, but. I did. <laughs> but. Don't do it if that student is registered for the course. If they're registered for the course, they will appear. They may not be there right away. It may take four hours or so for them to come in after they register because the process that puts them in only runs every four hours. But uh, if it's somebody you want in there as say an outside observer or something, you can just put them in. Oh, okay. But that does not then register them. They still have to register themselves. Oh yeah, they're not they're not registered for the course. They don't get any credit for it or anything like that. Uh, but don't don't do it for a student who's going to register though. Because if you okay. do, there'll be a collision when the automated process tries to put them in and problems occur. I see. So, so it's just if a friend is you, helping you. Yeah, this is just something you can use like for colleagues you want to share access to your shell with okay. or someone, uh, maybe a, an intern or something like that you wanted to have in there helping you. Um, and you got to decide who has access to your classes. So it should be someone with a legitimate reason to be in there, but you're the one who gets to make that decision. Right. Okay. But don't, don't just because a student is having trouble registering and you want them in there or don't do that because it, well especially don't use their um their login their um, um, user id their student id because then the canvas 
um, PeopleSoft integration process is going to try to put them in again, and there's going to be a problem. I see. Okay. You see what I mean? So, but but you have the capability to do this, uh, and and the right to do it. Okay. okay. And um, I would certainly point out to my students all the resources that are available to them on using Canvas. So those are the best practices I can give you on that. I copied an old course to a current shell, which you can very easily do. Uh, if you create a course shell in Canvas now, and you want to use that content again next semester, you're going to get a new shell next semester. It'll be blank. But you can copy the content from this semester shells into the new one. And it takes about, uh, of your effort, it takes about 15 seconds after you've done it once to copy that content over. And you don't have to recreate everything from scratch. God forbid, nobody would use Canvas. You had to do that. I wouldn't use Canvas. At the, uh, let's see, it, it ta you talked about items not, but I can, can't remember how to change. There are no grades. Uh, let's see, I can't figure out. Items, I'm not sure what you mean by items. Uh, talked about, about items being not visible. Maybe you're talking about links in the course menu? I'm talking about the items that will be listed over on the left, like quizzes and different things like that. They have, remember yesterday we were talking about the little uh -huh. eye, so you can't right. see. So you are that, talking about the course. You are talking about the course menu then. Yeah, yeah. The, the visibility. Okay. Uh, and so the original one also had the eyes showing so they weren't visible. Now I copied right. into the new one and it has the same thing. Is there some way? I don't remember if exactly there was a way to get those back to visible. Yeah, uh, absolutely. To control visibility of items in the course menu, you go to the settings link in the course menu mm -hmm. and to the navigation tab on the settings page. Up here at the top, there's several tabs. Go to the navigation tab. If you want something to be visible, it has to be above this line. Um, like if I wanted outcomes visible, I'd have to drag it up here and you just click and drag. Okay, just one second. I'm gonna try to do this in the, in the course. So I go to my course, I go to settings. Settings, navigation tab. Navigation tab, okay. Okay, uh, and just drag stuff up and down. Yeah, I got it, I got it. I and got when it. you make a change, be sure to save it. <laughs> Don't okay. do like I do and forget to save it and wonder where the heck it went. Um, Thank goodness. And I then that makes the change in your course menu. Now outcomes is visible here, except that outcomes is not, then I, it's visible to me now. But this icon tells me it's not visible to students. Uh -huh. There's another way that one of these things cannot be visible to students, and that's if it's empty. I don't have any outcomes set up. Okay. Canvas will not show a menu option to students if that menu option has nothing behind it, is empty. Like right. the syllabus tool here is not visible to students because I haven't set it up. There's nothing in it. Well, there is something in it, but it's not showing. Actually, I think I may have dragged that one down. That's why that one's not empty or not showing. But I had somebody today who said, well, wait a minute. My modules tool is not showing to students yet. I didn't drag that down below the line because they hadn't created any modules yet. It was uh, empty. So Canvas won't show an empty tool okay. or one that hasn't been set up to students. So that's a two-part answer on that one. And then we're Dave. Going, oh, yes. It is at the bottom. I got it. Never mind. I'm good. 
Okay, Dave. Good. Yeah. Okay, yes. Dave, how do you get to your first module? Like, you, I know you go, get into the welcoming page and tell me that this is the first orientation, what have you. How do you get to your first module? You know, Click that you have to do, because we're, we're taking the class. And, right. uh, oh, and I know you go the to the modules. Course. I'm sorry? In the training course you're referring to. Yes, in the training course. Ah. And if you go to your, your syllabus, it'll tell you where the modules are. And you t click on the modules and it'll give you the module, first module, right? Right. Okay. All right. Click on the modules link. That, that link right. is almost always there. And you can click on it and then you'll see such modules as have been created in that course. Okay. So you may you just... not see all of the modules. That training course makes use of some advanced techniques in Canvas that allow you to govern whether students can see modules or not. But I'm not Called, talking about this. I'm not talking about the students. I'm talking about I'm a student of your class. No, you're you are a student in that training course. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, but I was I asking about this students in that course. I was asking. To Okay, I was asking this question to, uh, so that how did it, how does the person get to the module, the, the orientation where you get to the modules so they can start do, do, doing the, the modules? Uh, well, let's look at that course real quick. Okay. Oop, I got to be, I got to be administrator me instead of instructor me to do that because in, instructor me is not enrolled in that class. Okay, let's see. Let me find the current one going on here. That's last year's. Here's this year's. Go into it in the usual way. Okay, we're told here. Read the announcements. Read the welcome letter. Read the syllabus and begin module one. Well, there's the link to module. If I want to skip over the the dull stuff like like the average student i can go right here to module one and click on that that's the one that i got but my other classmate she didn't that one hmm. oh and they haven't even locked oh they've taken the locks off these i'll be darned used to be you'd get module one but none of the other modules when you did that and then you'd, you'd have to finish module one. And there's a way that you could prevent somebody from moving on to another module until they finished everything in the first yes. module, in the previous module. And they used yes. to have that set up, but it looks like they've taken that off. Yeah. Probably well, it, because it does get locked. Mm -hmm. It does get locked because I'm just on module two now. And it, when I finish, oh if I can unlock it, then I can go to the next one. But no, I'm that's in, right. You're I, right. I, I ran I'm not in day. here as a. I'm not in here as a student. Let me let me go in as a student. That just you're right. That hit me. Let me go to student view. Okay. Click module one. Yeah, that's what I expected. Yes. Exactly. You can see module one, but you can't see module two. Yes. I think well, how module. How do you get the two, module one? How do if I get to module one? Not, yeah, if a person has not taken done the module one, how do they get to that one so they can do the module one? Right there, where it says begin module one, down at the bottom of the page here. This is the home page. This is what you see when you enter. I that's that's home. what I saw. Yes. Yeah. So you begin module one. Um, the uh, that will be explained in the announcements and the welcome letter or the syllabus one of the mm -hmm. three or, or all three but you can guess right off the bat that maybe that would take you to module one right which, it did it did it, it does but then you can't get to module two until you finish module one right right but is it possible that a person if they did not receive module one could they go in and get it now could well, they go they, back there's, there's no receiving it. I mean, it's just there. 
and that link is yeah. right there for everybody. Yeah, that's so yeah, but I, I don't think been, they got this particular page. I don't think they got that. Oh, they, I, no, this is the this is what everybody sees when they enter the course. Okay. Every everybody. They have to, they have to click on home to to get that. No, no. All I have to do is enter the course. This so is what's called course. This is the course entry point. Okay. So this is where everybody gets dropped when they enter right. the course. Whether okay. they're the course owner or the newest student, they see this page and then okay. they click here and they go to module one. Modules. Okay. It's click on interesting. The I can yeah, go to module one and start. Mm -hmm. Okay. And take it in order. Yeah. Because you can't take it in, thing, you can't take it any other way because you got to finish one before you can go into the other one. And that's the whole point in setting right, it up that way. Right, right, mm -hmm. And that's, Thank you. That's, good that's good online pedagogy, and we're trying to model that here. Yes, yes. But what they have done, let me get out of student view here and show you what they've done there. If I go to the modules, because mm -hmm. this is something you might want to use yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. When you go to module two and edit it, mm -hmm. There's a requirement set. Students must move through requirements in a sequential order. That's something. But they can't get to the next module until they've done all of this right. in the previous module. You have to module. do a lot of reading. It's a lot of reading. Right. And that's you know and once you read and they're just you not gonna let you go forward until right. you've completed all the reading so, uh, that's the uh that's good online pedagogy it's not yeah. comfortable to have it applied to you but it's good online <laughs> pedagogy yeah. it's the kind of yeah. thing you'd want your students to do yeah well i'm in okay. module two so i and i've gotten to the what? to that point where you got to insert the a video, you know, and and I got lost on that, so I have to go back and do it again. Go and read how to do it again, and so on. Yeah, yeah. And that's yes. the beauty of an online course. If you miss something, you can go back and read again. it again. Mm -hmm. Keep yeah. going until you until you get it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Uh, thank you. And that was a that was a nice illustration for everybody there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All righty, let me go back to the dashboard here and see how, uh, bidi 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 bidi. what are the three bullets at the top right of the screen? Oh gosh, I'm sorry, Susan. I, I don't know which screen that was at this point. Um, was this in Zoom? Are you still here? Yes. Hi, Dave. Um, hi. It's the next to our name so if we have a video displayed when we're attending the zoom session there's three ah. bullets at the top of where our screen is in the top right yes there's uh, what i see anyway is a uh, button that allows you to switch between the speaker view and gallery view uh gallery view is like a Hollywood Squares kind of view. You can see everybody at one time. And it's kind of neat. That's the way I run the session for me most of the time. Yes. Uh, there's also a button that allows you to go full screen. Or I'm not. talking, Dave, I'm talking about um, my, my, my box, my Hollywood Square box, if you will. Up at okay. the top right, there's a mute, unmute. Then there's ah. There's three bullets to the right. A three. There's a menu. Um, okay. Menu button that the okay. three dots in a row, the ellipsis indicates a menu. Yes. In most software, if you click on that, you see options like mute my audio, stop my video. Okay. Rename me like you don't like the name that you've got in your Zoom account, you can, or you want to be anonymous or something like that. You can rename your what shows up under your little Hollywood Squares square. Uh huh. Um, 
you can even edit your profile picture if you don't. Oh my God, I can't believe I uploaded that. You can change your profile picture on the fly. Okay. So, uh, okay, that's excellent. Just so, little, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That, that, I could okay, have answered thank, that myself. Thank you for, thank you for letting me know which ones you were talking about. I'm yeah. sure. Okay. All righty. Uh, how do my uh, next question? How do I make closed captions visible on my Zoom recording? I edited the closed captions, but don't see the closed caption icon. Uh oh. Um, hmm, that shouldn't happen. Closed captions, whether you upload your Zoom recording to the Zoom cloud or to YouTube, both of which are options your video should be automatically captioned and it sounds like it sounds like it was but then you went in but in both cases whether it's on the zoom cloud or the youtube you um can edit those captions and it sounds like when you edited them they went away um uh, nicola where is is that recording on the zoom cloud or um on youtube if you're still here i don't think you are. I don't know why that would happen. <laughs> I'd have to look at the individual situation. All right. Sorry about that. You don't have to be present to win, but I have to be able to, I have to have enough information to answer the question <laughs> and I'll record the answer. Uh, and we already answered that one. So if I made an account through Canvas, can it be linked to the college one? Well, your Canvas account is created by the college. I made one and created text in it, but it did not, but did not publish. Uh, I don't suppose the person who asked that note doesn't appear to be here. Don't really have enough information to answer that one. Sorry about that. I think they're cutting us off. <laughs> I'm sorry? I think they're cutting us off. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. This account has no time limits on it. We, <laughs> we can stay here way longer than you want to. <laughs> it comes down to it. <laughs> um, uh, all right. Well, I need Word and Excel to use with Canvas. Well, they're handy, but no, you don't have to have Word and Excel in order to use Canvas. Certainly not. Unless you're teaching Word or Excel. <laughs> All of our classes have been canceled for the spring in cosmetology, right? No way to do cosmetology uh, without <laughs> online, I understand. I'm missing one of the reasons my hair is so wild is that I can't get to the cosmetology department at the Spokane Community College where I have them trim my hair for five bucks a shot. So I empathize. Oh boy. All of my shells are there. This is confusing because when I asked for help, he went to the class I was to be teaching instead of helping me put in the module I needed to get certified to teach online. Tessie, that was you. Are you still here? I see Tessie's chair. <laughs> Let's see Tessie. Oh, uh, hopefully she'll come back, and I can, I can, we can talk about that. I don't know how this would apply to lab, but that is performance classes. Um, well, you could post information for your performance students on Canvas like videos of people performing. Um, you could put written information, text documents and so on that described performance standards and things like that. But you certainly can't evaluate. Well, actually you could evaluate performance through Canvas. You could put a, uh, a homework assignment in Canvas that said, make a video of yourself using your smartphone performing this particular 
uh, dance or this particular uh, exercise or whatever the performance might be, this particular experiment, say, uh, hopefully it didn't involve anything dangerous, and um, then upload that video to this assignment. I will view it and I will grade you on your performance. So yes, you can do, you can use Canvas to, uh, to assess performance and to demonstrate performance by posting videos. But can you be present with someone while they're performing something? No, but you can use Zoom and be in real time with the, with the person who's performing and interact with them in real time. So Zoom and Canvas together really make a much, much more powerful or provide a much better educational experience than either one alone. Because with Zoom, you can interact in real time and you can see each other and you can talk to one another. Uh, but you can't really assess, well, you could assess performance by watching the person perform through Zoom, but maybe, the, maybe you can't be online at the same time. Maybe that person needs to do this on their own schedule. Well, then you can use Canvas for asynchronous activities. So you combine the two together and you get what's called blended learning and study after study after study by educational professionals has indicated that blended learning is far better than either fully synchronous learning like you do with Zoom or you do in a classroom or fully online learning where you never see one another and you just communicate through Canvas and you, you view things and you do things in Canvas and so on. Blended, a mixture of both, is by far the best educational modality and study after study demonstrates that where they've compared different control groups to one another and so on. And it, um, I read an article the other day that said that, you know, something good may come out of this because people are finally going to realize that what we what educational researchers have known for years that blended learning is the best way to do that do this not fully online not fully face to face but a mixture of both works better than either one alone okay i'll get off that soapbox <laughs> uh carol i see you're trying to uh, talk but i believe you're muted You can just press your space bar and talk. There we go. We, there also, you are. Mm -hmm. we also teach theory classes, which is the book part of it. So right. this uh, canvas is good for that and particular it's subject. Much better suited for that. Right? Yes. Yeah. But what you said about suggesting that they do a performance or you know whatever video of themselves, whatever their assignment is and can upload it and send it to us that we can evaluate it on that. Is yeah, that what you're saying? It's not ideal, but it's better than nothing, right? Right, because that's the only way we're gonna be able to do it. <laughs> uh, probably right through the summer, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully we're gonna have a class for some of us. We're getting to teach this class. Now I have to get certified so I can teach the class for the summer and it will be a um, theory class. It'll just gotcha. be book, you know, yeah. Yeah, and but, Canvas is ideal for that. But yes, that doesn't is. mean that it's not nice to talk to your students sometimes too. Mm -hmm. yes. So yes. mixing yes. Canvas with Zoom mm -hmm. gives a much better experience for the students mm -hmm. and for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't, I, you know, I, like most of you, I came up, I was a classroom instructor for 15 years before I started mm -hmm. playing with toys. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, you know, I, I don't want to give that up. Yes. And Zoom yeah. allows me to do that, even though I can't be in the physical presence of right. you all. Mm -hmm. And it allows me to do it quite effectively. Yeah. So, uh, and without leaving Northern Idaho. <laughs> yeah. So combining well, all that together, really. Yeah. We'll probably get it all together before june come <laughs> that's when we cut scheduled to go back to uh, you know, let's hope they said they were going to cancel the classes maybe 
maybe we'll go back to teaching, but we got to learn this can to be able to teach it online. And I hear we have you. to come up with well, some you, kind of way. You you've know. made a good start. Actually, you know probably 60 or 70% at this point of what you need to know. If you go back and view that mm -hmm. overview again, that's maybe yeah. 60 or 70% at least of what you need to know. Mm -hmm. uh, the only you thing, just only have, part I'm you gotta going jump to through the hoops in that course to demonstrate yeah. it. But okay. you're really- I am. I'm gonna start jumping too. <laughs> Here you <laughs> Thank no you. No options at this much. point. You bet. All right. And but this is the kind of thing we can do in Zoom. That we really it just doesn't work as well in Canvas. Uh, let's see. How, like info on how to navigate. I'm guessing navigate Canvas. I hopefully we, we saw that. How to download Zoom on your phone. Um, anybody, I uh, Cindy, I see you still there. Um, did you need that information or would, did you just want me to show that to the group? Uh, hi Dave, I, I don't know if that was my question. That was your question, yeah. How, what was it? <laughs> Forgot. So how how do you put how do you get Zoom on your phone? No, I I have a handout for that for my students. Send it to oh, them. Oh, good, good, okay. good, excellent. But I have some other questions there. Okay, I'm working my way down. Okay. Ah, how is it best to import a site like Spelling City? Link it or, yeah, I assume Spelling City is a is a website. That, people could go to and practice uh, uh, spelling. And the probably the best thing in Canvas would be to just put a link to that, maybe with some instructions on what to do once they get there. Okay, and once I put that link in say module one um, and it's an assignment, can they go back to that same link to do the next vocabulary words we're gonna study? Because I put in so many vocabulary words and then they practice them and then I'll have uh, next lesson, new vocabulary words. So uh, they can keep using that same link? Yeah, uh, well, yeah, it, it just depends on where you put the link. If you put it in the assignment instructions, eventually they may not be able to get back to that assignment, depending on how you set your availability dates. Oh, okay. So you may want to put that link to uh, Spelling City in a module outside by itself outside the assignment okay so and a separate me, module just for spelling city uh yeah you could just create a module for spelling city let me go to the our uh, sandbox and i need to find spelling city Nothing can hide from you on the internet, <laughs> including each other. There it is, spellingcity.com. That made sense. All right, there's the URL. I just copy that. Go back to Canvas. And um, I can just make a module for Spelling City. And there at the bottom, it automatically comes in at the bottom. So now I can just make a, an external link, external URL, paste that spelling city URL in there, and call it spelling city access. I like to load in new tabs, that's just a thing for me. Mm -hmm. And I add the item, publish it. Now the student comes in, clicks on that, and OK is opening a new window. Bada bing. Awesome. There. Make this that all look so easy. <laughs> Thank you. You bet. I love that. That's cool. I had not seen that before. Yeah. OK. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, in fact, Great. I'll do that shortly. Uh, 
is it just you and I here? Like, cause I uh, nope, there's about, uh, well, how many are there? Seven of us left. Oh, okay. Cause I'll, I'll wait then. I'm working down. Um, I think I've covered this before, but is there a pro or con from you? Um, uh, adding a link to a video, I think we were talking about, as opposed to an embed. Well, the, yeah. the yeah, link. Yeah, we talked about that. Yeah, we talked about that. Good. Okay. Then you, you, they, you don't send them directly to YouTube. They view it in the context of Canvas, so there's less distraction. <coughs> and less storage, right? Both. Yes. <laughs> Um, well, no, either way, whether you do a link or an embed, it's still just, the video is still not in Canvas. It's on YouTube or Zoom Cloud or wherever it's stored on the, on the web. It's not in Canvas. You can upload video directly to Canvas and play it from there, but there are lots of negatives associated with that. We strongly recommend against it. We recommend that you put your videos on if they're your videos, put them on YouTube. Or if they're Zoom recordings, put them on the Zoom cloud or YouTube, either way. And they'll play better from there and they won't be using up storage space in your course where you only have a gigabyte of storage. And with video, you can use a gigabyte of storage in a New York minute. Um, the, uh, like the recording for what we're doing right now will be several hundred megabytes in size uh, if it were uploaded directly into Canvas. And you've only got, you could only put two or three of those into your Canvas shell before it'd fill up. So it's much better to put them on YouTube or somewhere else. Let's see, um, but, but for student services, uh, for example, mental health, who are making a Canvas shell, how do we send out a mass invite to faculty and students via the distribution link, uh, distribution list and email links? Uh, I'm guessing, I mean, how would you get students to end the course to register themselves for the course? And, um, have access to the course. And you can do that with a course shell that is not a, an instructional shell, like linked to a course with a CRM. Those you can't do, and I'm about to show you how to do. But let's say you have a course shell or a shell, a Canvas shell, that is intended for use uh, for a value added use an administrative or collegial use in Canvas, which is certainly something we can do. How would you get people to notify people of it and get them into it? Well, you can go to the settings link in your course and go to the course details tab and scroll down and select more options at the bottom, like you needed more options than you already had. There's an option to let students self-enroll by sharing with them a secret, ooh, a secret URL. If you check that and update it, scroll back down, This course has enabled open enrollment. Students can self-enroll in the course once you share with them this URL. And it gives you the URL. You can then send that URL to your client population through distribution lists, email links, and so on. They can click on the link in the email and that will take them into Canvas and walk them through the process of enrolling in this shell. Again, you can't do this with a CRN-based shell, a shell that is set up for an active instructional course. 
but for a shell that is used for non-instructional purposes, like what was described here, a mental health resource shell, which is a great idea. You can set it up this way so that anybody you, who wishes to can enroll themselves into the shell as a student, with a student level access. And you and had, get access to the information and the links and the communication tools that are stored in that shell. Uh, let's see, for educational purposes, copy. Uh, nope, we, we answered that one. Um, pages, assignments, etc., can only go into a module that has already been created. Right, you have to create a module before you can add links to it. You can't just, well, if you want them in a module, yes, but if you are not using content modules, if you just want to put homework assignments or quizzes or graded discussions in a course without creating modules, you can do it. You can go to the assignments tool and you can add assignment and you can create a homework assignment that way. And if you give the students the access to the assignments tool, they can reach it there and satisfy it without having a module. You can do the same thing with quizzes in the quizzes tool by adding a quiz. And all your quiz will quizzes will show up here and your students can take them from here. They wouldn't have any context. They wouldn't have any information about the quizzes, but they could take them from here. And you can do the same thing with discussions. You can create discussions in your discussions tool rather than in, the mo in a module and just not put them in a module. And then the students can access the discussions from the discussions link in the course menu. So yes, you can do that. That is definitely not the recommended way to do things, but you can do that. <sighs> Oh, that's nice. Uh, oh, here's a question I get a lot. If I have tests as Word documents, do I have to type them to Canvas? What about use of the textbook we are using in class? Well, two questions. The first one, what if you have some quest tests that you've typed into Word documents or that have been provided to you as Word documents by a publisher or something like that? Can you get those into Canvas without having to retype it or copy paste from the Word document into Canvas, into the Canvas question creation interface? And the answer is, there is a way to do it, but it's rather convoluted. And it's not, I wouldn't say difficult, but it's tedious. Uh, I am working on a tutorial to show how to do that. It's one I keep having to put back on the back burner as more urgent things come up. But there is a way to do that without spending any money. If you want to spend money, you can buy a program called Respondus. Let me put that in the put that into the chat tool. Respondus is uh, something called, among other things, is a test parser that will allow you to feed it a Word document and it can create a file that will import into Canvas without you having to retype the questions in. The respondus used to be fairly expensive, a hundred dollar or more range. I don't know what it is now. And I haven't used it in a long time, so I don't know how well it works anymore. So I can't really recommend it. But the, it is a somewhat less <laughs> um, involved technique, maybe. Though I, from what I remember of respondus, it really wasn't all that easy to use either. 
So maybe the free the free method would work without a whole lot more effort. I've got to I've got to get that tutorial going for that. If you have a if you, if that's an issue for you, and you've got a lot of Word documents that you want to get into Canvas, send me an email and ask me to finish. You can just type in finish the damn tutorial, <laughs> and I, that will give me a spur because <laughs> I need to do that. I know I do. Um, I will tell you that I don't know uh, if any of you are old enough to remember Rube Goldberg or not. But he was a contributor to the Saturday Evening Post back in the 50s and 60s. And he would design impossible machines that would, very complex machines that would accomplish simple tasks extremely inefficiently, but in a very entertaining way. If you've ever played the kids' game Mousetrap, Mousetrap is a Rube Goldberg machine. And what I'm working, what I'm doing, writing the tutorial on or filming it, is a Rube Goldberg, is a virtual Rube Goldberg machine. But it does eventually catch the mouse. So send me the email, <laughs> get me off top dead center on that, and I'll show you how to do it. It's it's too involved to show you right now online, unfortunately. All right. Thank you very much. You bet. And please do send me the email. <laughs> Just as I worded it. <laughs> it'll it'll have some, okay. some impact. Um, okay, let's see. I'm getting back up to where uh, the questions were. Uh, what about the use of the textbook we're using in class? Uh, well, if you have, if it's available online to your students, you can put a link to it in Canvas. Um, if you have a PDF version of it, a file, a computer file version of it, you could always upload that to Canvas, share it with your students. If it's something you've adopted, that might be a, a minor copyright transgression, but you'd probably get away with it. Um, but without more detail, I can't really speak to that without a further to that, without a little more detail. Okay. Uh, where do students submit the work? I showed that, uh, both for tests and assignments. Uh, talked about that. Please send the link to this recording. Ah, I should have said that. This recording will be on our open on-demand uh, video tutorial site, hopefully sometime in the next day or two under workshop archives. There are already recordings of this, uh, like the most recent one that's on there right now is from March 27th, but it's the same topic. So much, mostly the same information. And there are actually several more of those if you scroll down and go to further uh, further to pages. And this site is available at sdccdoldid.org. And I just put that in the chat tool. Right here it is, you can see it on the screen. And we put all of our tutorials in there. There are menus for some of it. Like if you want a basic introduction to Canvas and you don't want to spend less time than they've spent today, we have a whole series of basic quick Canvas tutorials under this link here. Uh, six, five, six of them on everything from accessing Canvas to homework assignments. Basically what I've showed you today, only quicker. The homework assignment tutorial is less than eight minutes long. 
So, uh, so this is where, but this is also where this uh, uh, recording of this session will be. <coughs> okay. Sorry, I'm I'm regaining my place in the chat tool. <laughs> A lot of good questions today. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Artith. <laughs> Nobody outside trimming your trees. Oh, Lord. Okay. Uh, here's a question about Zoom. When I want to put my students in a breakout room with the purpose of pair or group work, they can no longer see the document that has the questions I want them to discuss. Right, because you're not in there with them sharing your screen. How can I best manage it so the pairs and groups can have the questions in the breakout room I've sent them? Um, and you use breakout rooms all the time, you need a way to manage that. Let me think about that. So you have to provide a document to them, basically, in the breakout room. Cindy, I'm gonna have to do a little research on that. I haven't tried that. So I will uh, make a note here. Doc, share in Zoom breakouts. Thank you, Dave. Um, I want to mention that I've been asking a lot of people this question that are mentors or um, people who supposedly might know, but um, nobody seems to have an answer. So if you don't find an answer, I wouldn't be surprised. But I'm asking you because you're the guru. <laughs> so. Well, yeah, I struck out too. But um, <laughs> You know, you may have to do a workaround, like emailing them the document in advance or something like that. But I'll tr I'll find. I know there are some document sharing options in Zoom, but I don't know how they work or if they work in a breakout room. Okay, super. Um, so said that's something I need to know. So I yeah, will find out. <laughs> I'm sure it would be very helpful for other teachers. And I'm sure said it would. Be. Yeah, someone suggested have the students take a picture of your screen, sharing it with them. But I don't think the students can get all the questions on the screen unless I no, make, they, make it smaller. Right, they wouldn't be able to get, a, uh, get the entire document that way unless it were a very small document. So Yeah, and students that are on their phones, we, we know those challenges. Uh, I think oh, yeah. one of my students had half a screen on her iPad. She's teacher, I can't see the left part of your document. And I'm like, oh, and I had no idea how to fix that. I think it was her iPad. Uh, well, probably it was the way she had, there are options about how you view a shared screen and you can um, make it fit your screen, but you have to know how to do that um, as, a, uh, as an attendee. Okay. And I don't know how to do that on the iPad. I haven't had an iPad since the iPad one. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. but um, I can find out how to do that on a smartphone. I do have that. Um, so that's another good idea for a tutorial. Um, viewing options. If you're on a computer, when I'm sharing my screen, there's a little uh, options menu at the top of the screen, and there's a little button on it that says View Options. Uh huh. And there, you can click and say Fit to Screen, and then they'll be able to see everything you're sharing. But I don't know how that works or if it works on an iPad. And are the three um, ellipses in where are they located on the Zoom? It's I would be on Zoom, so it must be in the right, right just as you are right now. Um, I, on the mobile device, I don't know. I'm going to have to look. 
the on a computer it'll be at the top of the screen most likely okay screen viewing options screen share view on mobile that's a good question well it sounds like a be a very short easy tutorial today so i'll find out do me a favor, would you, and email me that question so I know I get that back to you as soon as I find it. Yeah. Otherwise, okay. I'll forget. Sure. Thank you. Will you? Yes, you can go right into Canvas now. Since you have ongoing classes, and you can go right into your Canvas shells and start loading content right away. And as soon as you publish the course, and it, every time you go into Canvas, it reminds you to publish your course. Uh, as soon as you publish the course, your students can start using your Canvas shell right away. Okay. What is the address link for getting started for Canvas certification? Really good question. Um, that is on our website, on the Online Pat Learning Pathways website which is www.sdccdonline.net. It's also linked to the, uh, to the district and the college and continuing at home pages, but you can just go straight there. And go to faculty, resources, and training. And here's the online faculty certification program. And here is the page for that. And let me put that link in the chat tool. So go to that link to get started would be the answer to that question. And remember, you can save the chat log. All right. Um, uh, Cindy, oh, today I didn't need a password. I assume you mean to get into the Zoom meeting. There are just four of us left, and Cindy, you're there. Okay. Is it possible for us also not to have our students have a password when they join us on Zoom? Oh boy, I'm going to maintain my blood pressure while I'm answering this question at a safe level. <laughs> I have been Zoom has been messing with me too. I last Friday I had a bunch of people not be able to get into a session. Probably you were one of them too, because they set a password overnight on my personal meeting room and didn't tell me. And I'm being calm about it. <laughs> I wasn't calm on Friday morning. <laughs> I used to, in my office, I used to keep a box of small, uh, inexpensive, but breakable items <laughs> next to my desk. <laughs> and one of them would go up against the wall and something like that happened. It, uh, it's great blood pressure reduction technique. But um, anyway, yes, there are ways, there are things you can do. Um, let me show you that. Okay. Uh, assuming you were, I take it you are still interested in that. Oops, yes, that's definitely. That's what I want to show you, me with my mouth open. Uh, let me find, I've got Zoom open here somewhere, the Zoom website open. The answer is you got to go to the Zoom website which I guess I don't have up right now. So let me bring that up. Zoom.us. By the way, Cindy, the reason you didn't have to have a password today to get into this meeting was that I'm using a link that has the password embedded in it. Oh. And that's what Mary sent out to everyone. Mm -hmm. And I was, afraid to take the password off because then that link wouldn't work <laughs> and people wouldn't be able to get in because they didn't need a password. So 
So I didn't want to mess with it. But I can show you how you can mess with it so that your students do not need a password to get into your meetings. Uh, you go to Zoom and you log in to your account. There's a sign in button on the Zoom website if you're not already logged in, I, which obviously I am, I wouldn't be able to hold this meeting. But if I sign in as me, it knows who I am. I can go, Cindy, are you using your personal meeting room? Well, I use both. I use my personal meeting room for friends and others that I use because I don't want my students to come into that meeting. And then I right. have re reoccurring regular meetings for all of my classes. That you have scheduled. Yeah, that's previously okay. scheduled. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, to eliminate passwords, <clears throat> you can go to settings. And there are password settings that you can turn on and off. If you scroll down, uh, require a password when scheduling new meetings. You can turn that off so that when you schedule a meeting, there's no password on it. Okay. Require a password for instant meetings. You can turn that off too. So if you do a quick meeting for colleagues or something like that, maybe in your personal meeting room, and you don't want there to be a password, you can turn that off too. But I was, told, off. I was yes. told that Zoom, um, I th Zoom, I think, I think I even saw a video from the president of Zoom who said that they are bypassing all of that now and require passwords for all meetings. So there's maybe, a way to get, a, there's a way to stop that too. Okay. Okay, I, I'm not advocating one way or the other. I'm just going to show you where the tools are. Uh, okay. And also, there's an option to require or not a password for your personal meeting room. Okay. Um, so, you, you set all those to off if you want to get rid of the passwords. Then, you go to uh, meetings. Mm -hmm. And you can also do this in the Confer Zoom tool in Canvas. That's just an interface to, to get you to the same tools that you're using here. On your personal meeting room, you will probably find this, where it says require meeting password, and then it gives the password. Mm -hmm. But you can go to the bottom of the screen and you can edit this meeting. And that will give you the option to turn that off. Oh, okay, got it. It's a secret. And then you save that. Like I say, I don't dare do that. I, as much as I'd like to, I don't dare do that until we, I get a break in the a seam and the <laughs> so that Mary can say, no, you don't need that link anymore. It's this one. It's, go back to the old one. And if Zoom hadn't started doing things by default, this wouldn't be a problem. Well, I am not enamored of Zoom in that regard right now. They're the whoever's making these decisions. I understand they had a lot of bad publicity over a tempest in a teapot, really. And they they're panicking, basically. And we're all caught in the middle. I've had a number I've talked to a number of faculty who had problems with this. Students suddenly not able to access meetings. Um, anyway, neither here nor there. Uh, if you want to do this, if you want to affect schedule meetings, uh -huh. when you schedule a new meeting, go down and you have the option to turn the password off there too. What about all the meetings I already have set up? Um, you can go in and edit them okay. and turn that off. But if you've already sent, like, the, um, the link may already have that password embedded into it. And I'm not sure how your students are accessing your scheduled meetings, whether they're doing it through Zoom or through the Confer Zoom tool in Canvas or whatever. 
but changing that in the middle of mid, in midstream might cause problems. So because maybe I should wait. Yeah, maybe until okay. you have a time, until you have a chance to say send out a communication to everybody to say after this date you'll no longer need passwords passwords for our, my Zoom meetings. I'm going to turn that off, but I didn't want to do it uh, before that because I'm afraid I wouldn't get the word out to everybody in time. And that's the exact situation I'm in. So uh, you can uh, so you can turn that off. For a while, Zoom had that locked and you couldn't turn it off. And I suspect they got some very uh, loud and specific suggestions <laughs> with what they could do with that from angry users. And, and at least they turned the locks off. But um, this, the account I'm using here is a standard confer Zoom account, just like yours. Okay. So you can do that. Whether, when and whether you do that is up to your judgment. <laughs> I can tell you, I'm gonna do it just as soon as I can do it without causing more trouble than I'm saving. Ah, uh, let's see. Oh, and another question from you. Uh, is it advisable to show the students a screenshot or best to add the link of the page you're looking at and want to share with the students? I tried downloading a screenshot and it didn't work. So maybe I don't know. Huh. Or they won't down. No, screenshots will certainly download into Canvas or upload into Canvas. But can you tell me a little bit more about what you were trying there? Okay, um, sure. It was yesterday and I was, what was I showing them? I think it was East Civics where we're doing um, state required um, objective. And I was trying to show them how to authorize. I guess the, the module was already created and luckily I was able to download that from Canvas Commons into Canvas course. Okay. Right. And when when they did, I don't I don't really understand how it all works, but they my students had to authorize through Google to download either a video or a document. Oh, it was a document on how to fill out a message path form. And I was like so lost. But I said, there's an authorize button, just click it, go through Google, and then my students were like, teacher, I don't have Google. And I'm like, okay. Uh, so anyway, it was a big thing, and they all have to get a Google account to do the message pad form. Oh, boy. <laughs> Yikes. Account, yeah, it was kind of a mess. Google.com. I tell you, I, well, I can tell you what I would do in that circumstance. Okay. I would make a screencast, which you can do using Zoom, showing me going in and authorizing and signing up. And then I would save the recording and either put it on the Zoom cloud or put it on YouTube and send the students to link to it. And then they could watch what I did and then hopefully imitate it themselves. And that would take them right through the process of creating a Google account and all that. Um, because a single static screenshot probably you'd have to take a lot of screenshots. That's and what string I was them thinking. Together, like in a Word doc <laughs> or something like that, in order to show them that. That's where a, a video really comes in handy. And you can make a screencast like that by just starting a Zoom meeting without anybody else in it, and hit the record oh. button, and then do what you want them to do, and share your screen when you want to show them how to do something like on the Google website or something, when you want to show them that you share your screen and then you show the, you go through the process and talk about it while you're doing it. And Zoom records all that and that's called a screencast. And then when you get done, you just send the recording up to the Zoom cloud or to YouTube in ways that we've talked about before and then send your students the link. And they can watch what you did and then hopefully imitate it. 
And that's an extremely powerful way to uh, uh, cover complex processes that your students need to carry out on their own. Um, okay, I have a feeling I should try that and send it to a friend and see if it works first. <laughs> you know, oh, that's always a good idea. Or, well, you know, try it and put the video, say, up on the Zoom cloud and then watch it yourself and see if it makes sense to you. Oh, and if it makes sense idea. to you, it should probably make sense to your students. And you can, what I usually do in a situation like that is just send them the link to the video one way or another and say, and if you have questions about that, contact me. Okay, but that's a great most idea. of the information will be in the video. And even if they don't get everything the first time, they can watch it again. And even if they don't get everything after watching it a couple of times, at least they'll know the right question to ask. Yeah. And they'll have, they'll be familiar with the idea you're trying to convey. So it's a lot easier to help them once they've gotten to that point. And that's a, that's a wonderful uh, pedagogy. Um, it's also great for retention. A classic statistic is that uh, after 30 days, I forget what it is, 20 or 30 percent of people remember stuff they've read. 80% of people remember stuff they saw in a video. So it's a, <laughs> um, it's an interesting idea. Yeah, and it's, it's fun to try. You can explain anything to anybody. If you can bring it up on your computer screen and share it with Zoom and have Zoom record it. And then they can reference it anytime they need to if you provide them the link on the Zoom cloud or YouTube. If you have any questions with, about that or uh, you run into any roadblocks, just let me know. That's something I've been doing since 1992. So okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm reasonably familiar with that, uh, with that process. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Great, great questions. Hey, Dave, I have one more question. I've been coming to a lot of your meetings, as you know, and <laughs> I wonder, is the screencasting class that you uh, have available to your past students, I guess it was, is it available to us to watch? I mean, to go through that class and learn how to screencast well? You mean the one I use as an example in Canvas? Yeah. It would require some updating. Uh, some of those tools don't even exist anymore or are not usable. Um, but yeah, I should probably do that. There is a place you can go. It's not a formal course, but there is a place you can go to get a lot of information about doing things like that. And I'll put that in the chat tool. This is a, a site that also needs a little updating. It's something Katie Palacios created years ago, and I collaborated with her on it. Um, it's instructional video production, how to. And uh, the, let me put it in the chat tool. The name of it, it was an inside joke at the time. Huh? And I'm in the process of updating it, cleaning out some of the old information. And, but the vast majority of what's there is still perfectly valid and useful. I just put that at the bottom of the chat tool and I'll show it to you. The uh, site is sdccdolvid.org. It's in that same region, but it's called Get Real, G-E-T-R-E-A-L, one word. And it's uh, arranged by instructional video applications, uses. Different things you might be able to do with video. And there are also workflows that show you how to do these things. And some information on captioning, which is a little bit dated. But let's say you wanted to give feedback to your students. There's some examples of doing that. And there are workflows. 
that will accomplish that. And you go to the workflow and you get some background information on this and you say, hey, I'm ready to practice. And there's step-by-step -step instructions and video tutorials on how to accomplish that. When, so you, when is, you say workflow, what is it you mean? Do you mean? How, how to accomplish this. How to oh, accomplish I giving uh, Steps. feedback to your students through video. Okay. Another workflow jargon term, sorry. Uh, educational jargon term. <laughs> I had to have that explained to me too. <laughs> Never had an education course myself. But um, the, uh, anyway, there's a lot of good information in here. I got to get this, the workflow that's anything that refers to Camtasia, TechSmith Relay, no longer works. We, we lost our license for that. They, they walked away from the product. So that doesn't exist anymore for us. But most of this is good. Okay, and, super. Uh, and I'm going to fix it up. I, I got to take the old stuff out. We just started using it again. It had kind of lain fallow for a number of years since I retired. And Katie's moved on to other things. So it, um, I don't know if she's still using it. I don't think so because it hasn't been updated. But I'm going to update it. And she did some great work on this. It was marvelous. So that's something. But yeah, that, that flex course is something that would probably be really useful again. And when I retired, I just kind of walked away. You know, I, I didn't keep it up. So it, it fell out of use and it's dated now. And now I just use it because it's a conveniently sized and configured course to illustrate Canvas. But I could go in and I could update it and re-up it as a, an active flex course. I'll run that by the new dean and see what he thinks of it. But thanks for the suggestion okay. and the encouragement. Okay, sure. And uh, where can we find this Zoom meeting? Again, that is on sdccdolvid.org under workshop archives. And it will be right at the top under workshop archives. These are just listed chronologically once they're posted. So I've just got to get this one up there. And that's the, I'm at the bottom of the chat tool. <laughs> and there's three of us still left. <laughs> uh, but all of those answers were recorded, so people can come back and look at this later. Do either of you have anything else that you'd like to ask? Uh, I do have one uh, question about the the camera situation. After okay. I after I hooked up the camera and uh, saw it, everything was was fine. Um, now when I I was in a quick zoom thing this morning and my camera mm -hmm. is uh, flipped on my computer. Your document camera image is upside down? No, no, no. Just my computer, uh, my computer camera. Oh, you, your webcam. Camera. So your do you webcam know? is showing things upside down. Well, no, the camera was turned sideways first, showing sideways. So I got the I got the instructions for how to rotate the camera. Everything was good, but I noticed this morning that um, that uh, my camera was showing me in a Zoom uh, meeting as um, with with the with the sides of my face flipped. So the right side stuff was on the left and the left stuff ah, was ah, on the right. Do right. you know what I need okay. to, to do to? Yeah, yeah, I think I know where you can find that. I don't know if I can share it with you though. Let me uh, kill my, go see if I can get to the video. I can't get to the video menus while I'm sharing, shoot. Teaching Zoom on Zoom has some challenges because there are things Zoom just won't share with participants. Uh -huh. But I can I can try to walk, talk you through it. 
and okay. show you. Uh, and let me first let me show you what I think it is, and show you what happens, and see if that's what's happening for you. Um, if I go to my video settings and click mirror my video, uh huh, is that it? I, I think I did click on something that was mirror my video that they yeah, right. Okay, on. it's yeah, it, and it remembers that setting until you change it. Um, if you look in your Zoom menu at the bottom of the screen mm -hmm. and see that you see the little camera icon where you can turn your video on and off. Right, right. next to it is an up carrot, uh, a, right. an arrowhead pointing upward. Click on that up carrot. And you get a menu. Right. Go to video settings, which is the second from the bottom option. Yes. And that mirror my video setting is right below where you see your webcam's image. It's under my video, about it's about the fourth thing down. Mirror my it's video. Up. Okay. It's is unchecked it right now. Okay. Check it and see if it looks. Because yeah. the impact this has depends upon your camera. Yeah, that did it. Did that fix it? Yeah, that did it. That fixed it. Great. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Yeah. My personal favorite in that menu is touch up my appearance, which is right below mirror my video. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you can... Uh, it yeah, it does it out. Help? <laughs> smooths out the wrinkles a little bit. <laughs> First time I heard somebody talk about that, I thought they were joking, but it really is a feature in Zoom. <laughs> Unfortunately, I need something a little more heavy duty. <laughs> yeah, here too. <laughs> uh, that's, definitely. For, that's for somebody who's maybe 35. So, or something. Yeah, that works. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was great. Thanks. No nobody nobody uh, I had we had like seven people but no one noticed that stuff was on the other side. So, right. <laughs> so I just ignored <laughs> that. Knew, right. <laughs> okay, great. All right. All so right. we got that one. We got that one sorted out. Uh Cindy, I just got your text uh or your text message and chat you've gotten kicked out twice shoot i assure you it was nothing i did uh i haven't kicked anybody out today you can kick people out of your meeting as the host in case you have a zoom bomber come in and i'm going to be covering that on the wednesday i think it is tomorrow on the zoom security but i did certainly did not do that to you would not um most likely, yes, it was a burst of traffic on your local ISP's network or some of your internet service provider's network or something like that that, that dumped you out of the meeting. Uh, it's happened to me, um, particularly when I, when I first got up here, I had a very bad internet connection. It was very unstable, very low bandwidth. And periodically, I would just get dropped right out of my own meeting. <laughs> People just sitting there going, where'd he go? <laughs> kind of thing um so it's happened to me and that's most likely what happened uh don't worry about the chat log i can send that to you i i'll it'll mine saves automatically when i'm done uh if you wouldn't mind sending me an email to remind me <laughs> that's a that's always <laughs> a good idea i will uh send you as soon as the everything saves i'll send you the chat log uh, this evening or tomorrow morning or something so that you have that all, everything that's in there. Sorry about that, but it is something that can happen when your internet connection gets unstable. Though Zoom is surprisingly tolerant of fluctuations and interference on, on the internet and so on, but sometimes it, it, it just gets overwhelmed as well and, and will drop you out. Well, uh, thank you, Dave. You bet. Yes, Great thank questions. you so much. Have a wonderful evening. You too. And I hope you all see you again soon. I'm, oh, yeah. I'm
jealous of that lake behind you. When I retire, <laughs> I also want to find some lake I can look at for the rest of my life. So I'm what, telling you. what area did you find that in, Dave? This is in the Idaho Panhandle, northern Idaho, uh, about 60 miles south of Canada. Oh, nice. And, so you um, can go to Canada, too. That is Lake Ponderé in the... Uh, uh, just outside of Hope, uh, Hope, Idaho, is where I am. My wife had always wanted to live up here. She she lived here for two or three years when she was uh, uh, younger, mm -hmm. and had always wanted to come back. And she found this house on Zillow one day. We'd been looking for a place to retire for a couple of years, and this this thing just popped up on Zillow, and it was amazingly enough in our price range. Somebody was trying to sell it. They needed to sell it. And we came up that weekend. We flew up here from San Diego, from Temecula, and uh, put an offer on the house. And a couple of days later, we had it. Just one of those serendipity wow. things. She just ran across it. Sounds and like it was meant to be. She's been keeping an eye on real estate up here. So if you look around long enough, you can find the thing that you really want. And it was called uh, Lake, what did you? Like Ponderay. I'll have to put it in the chat tool. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, because I'd like to find a lake, uh, not too small, not too big, just something I can see, you know? That would be really great for retirement. Thank in you. In French, it literally means hanging from the ear. <laughs> the lake. I was wondering looks, what that meant. The lake looks like an ear. Oh, interesting. Look at it on a map. Yeah, I could Google so, map it and check it out. <laughs> yeah, Lake Ponderé in, uh, in Idaho. It's one of the larger freshwater lakes in the uh, lower 48 that's not a great lake. And are you fishing in it too? Are you catching fish? Oh, yeah, there's, they have, there's fishing, all kind of fishing. I'm not a fisherman, I'm afraid, but it's big fishing, hunting up here, uh, boating. Shoot, the Navy cool. has a research station down the south end of the lake where they test acoustics for submarines because the lake is so big and so deep. They have little model wow. submarines. They, they run through it and check for sound and things like that. Wow. So it, it's, a fa it's a beautiful lake, huge and just wonderful. This is, is, this the, is just one, what you see behind me is just one little bay of the lake. It goes on, on and on and on. Both directions. How's, how's the population in that area of Hope? Uh, Hope, the population of, uh, I'm in East Hope. <laughs> the population is 200. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's kind of quiet there. It, it pretty much is. It's a great place to ride this mess out, I tell you. <laughs> that there, our county has four confirmed coronavirus cases right now. Wow, that's um, surprising. And, uh, Sandpoint, the nearest town of any size, is about 7,800 people or something like that. It, and it's the county seat. It's the big town up here. So it's, it's very rural, which is why I had trouble getting internet for a long time. But yeah. finally, yeah, I, I couldn't. We just love northern Idaho. It's, it's a little cold in the winter, but actually here it's not nearly as cold. We're on the same at the same latitude as Glacier National Park. And, it, and Glacier is only about 100 miles to the east of us. And that's very cold, because I've been and there. And that's real cold. That's what, yeah. <laughs> Not as cold I, as it used to be, but it's cold. It's cold. Yeah. And here we, it's, it's, I, it is yet to drop below zero Fahrenheit here in the three years we've been here. We've been through three winters now. And it you hasn't know, dropped I, below zero. I slept in a van as I was traveling through Glacier National Park because I couldn't find a campsite. So Ooh. I was in the parking lot right across from the glacier, and I never really thought how cold it would be that night, but I felt like I was sleeping in an ice chest. <laughs> yep. <laughs> We've had nights like that here, too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, gotcha. That was fun, but I thought, I'm out of yeah. here. I'm not doing this again. <laughs> Yeah, I can I can leave here in the morning and be at Glacier by early afternoon. 
Wow. Yeah, I bet, it, I bet it doesn't look like it used to. I bet half of the glacier, or maybe most of it is gone now. I don't know. There's only, I think there's one glacier left in Glacier National Park, and that one's almost gone. Oh, that is so sad. It's sad. It's still spectacular. You know, the, the northern Rockies and so on are just spectacular, but, uh, but no glaciers. Uh, not much left in the way of glaciers, and the, ones, the one that's still there is on its way out. Wow. Wow. Yes. Okay, uh, Dave. Well, thank you. And it's so good to chat with you finally. And um, take care. And I'll send you this email with all these reminders. <laughs> thank you. Good to see you both, you and Vicki both. Uh, I will see you again soon. Okay. okay. Thanks. Bye, bye bye. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye bye.